Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the first biannual conference on uncertainty and economic activity, global perspectives. My name is Simon Sheng, Associate Professor of Economics at American University. So I'm the host for this conference. Uh, this event is being recorded. Live captioning uh, will be available throughout this conference. Now let's welcome Dean Max Friedman to give opening remarks. Hello, I'm Max Friedman, Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at American University. Welcome to this fourth biennial conference on uncertainty and economic activity, global perspectives. Following the first three successful conferences, American University is happy to be hosting you at this two-day gathering co-organized by the International Monetary Fund and the Federal Reserve Board. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown the world's economy into chaos, specifically with respect to the economic forces that affect global well-being, health, economic stability, and peaceful coexistence. The comfort level that determines how we act in our own households can govern global actions as well, individual, collective, and governmental. We are in a global economic emergency. Despite what we see daily on the tickers of the New York Stock Exchange, the massive increase in uncertainty since March of last year threatens to throw the global economy into chaos and may have already begun to do so. The forces at work today didn't start with COVID-19. They've been at work for a long time. But COVID-19 caused a measurable spike in uncertainty and thus in the threats of economic inequity and deprivation. Combined with the effects of Climate change, where models cannot have precision but produce an alarming consensus, we see that even such basics as supplies of food, medicine, shelter, and that most basic component of life, water, cannot be taken for granted. The title of this conference, Uncertainty in Economic Activity, Global Perspectives, means that you'll be hearing about and debating issues such as what triggers seemingly counterintuitive jumps in the stock market the turbulence of the real economy, the global impact of Brexit, a conflict that seems forever unresolved, household economic behavior, and the impact of weather changes. It is a stew worthy of debate at a time when we are in a race against a virus that threatens lives and has exposed social, racial, and economic inequities around the world. You will hear from two keynote speakers, Stephen Davis from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business on what triggers stock market jumps, and Nicholas Bloom of Stanford University on world uncertainty during the pandemic. I'd like to thank the International Monetary Fund and Federal Reserve for co-organizing this conference at American University. Conference organizers Hitesh Ahir and Davide Fucheri of the International Monetary Fund, John Rogers and Bo Sun of the Federal Reserve Board, and Simon Shang, Associate Professor of Economics at American University, as well as Chelsea Anderson of American University, who made this conference happen online. Again, welcome and thank you all for joining us. Okay, uh, thanks for Dean Friedman to give us such a great introduction. So for the general audience, uh, please mute yourself during the presentation. If you feel comfortable, please keep your video on. So when it's time for Q&A, please use the raise hand feature uh, at the bottom of your screen and turn your video to share your questions and comments. Now, it's my great honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Steve Davis. Steve is a distinguished professor of international business and economics at the Chicago Booth. Steve is a co-founder of the Economic Policy Uncertainty Project, the Survey of Business Uncertainty Project, and the Star Market Jumps Project. So what is most impressive about Steve is he has been working so hard. So now simply look at, so how many papers he wrote in the last year? Now 
this first page and on and on and on and on. Without further ado, let's welcome Steve to deliver the keynote speak on what triggered stock market jumps. Steve, the floor is yours. Thanks, Simon, for that overly kind introduction. So hopefully my dean believes in the labor theory of value. I'll get a big raise. Um, all right, let me share my screen here and put this into, okay. So, you know, what, one, one way to tackle uncertainty is to examine extreme events because just by virtually any, uh, any metric of uncertainty, extreme events will, will get an outsized weight. And th this is a paper about examining extreme events. And I wanna start by just giving you an idea of how it works. So consider some examples. The US stock market rose nearly 5% on the day after Christmas in 2018. Why, why it rose 5% is unclear. At least it was unclear to contemporaneous observers. And so this lack of clarity is reflected in, in newspaper accounts on the next day. Um, here's an article. Um, can't remember whether this is from the New York Times or Wall Street Journal. Um, but there's a key paragraph down here, uh, third paragraph, and here's what it says. So, so but is it in many of the volatile days that have characterized markets since the end of September, investors and traders were left scratching their head to explain the wild swing. There's a couple of interesting things about that passage. First, the journalist is very clear and explicit that nobody really knows why the market rose 5%, okay? So that's kind of an interesting observation in and of itself. Now, let's look at some other days and I'm just gonna, the, the, the one on the lower right here is the day I just talked about. These are um, S&P 500 index values uh, at one minute intervals. And you can see on that lower right, the market's kind of moving around. But then there's, there's two very different examples in the top two panels. The one on the upper left shows a, a very large upward movement in the market, um, more than 3% within a few minutes after a surprise rate cut announcement by the Fed. Okay, so in that episode, you can look at the daily behavior uh, of the stock market. It seems quite clear what triggered the market rise. And the one on the right, what you see is that the market fell sharply at open in the wake of a um, surprisingly bad BLS employment situation report. So you can see from these examples that I've uh, laid out here so far, both um, two in, at least two interesting research questions and the germ of a research design. The two questions that these examples suggest are first, the title of this paper, what triggers stock market jumps? We kind of like to know why does the market move around in big ways? But second, as the first example illustrates, there's perhaps the market moves around a lot for reasons that are completely um, unclear. So this is an old question in economics, going back to Keynes, Schiller, many others, as to whether um, markets are even responding to news about fundamentals at all. So <clears throat> that's, those are the kind of questions I wanna get at this paper. The research design is basically use newspapers, read them, Read the, read the next day newspaper accounts of extreme events in the stock market, but do it systematically and at scale, okay? So that's exactly what we do in this paper. So we use trained humans to read and code next day newspaper accounts of large daily jumps in national stock markets. Here's, here's an overview of the process. For each one of the countries in our sample, we've got 16 countries, we set a daily jump threshold. In the United States, that jump threshold is three and a half percent, okay, up or down, excuse me, two and a half percent, up or down. Okay, so a stock market move from the close of one day to the close of the next day, that's at least two and a half percent, we're going to pull into our uh, jump, our sample of jumps. That, that picks up about three and a half percent of all U.S. trading days, but it accounts for nearly half of the daily squared return variation uh, since 1900. So that's the first step. Now, the second step is playing partly off the first step. When you have jumps of that size, there's nearly always next day art newspaper articles that talk about the jump and that 
usually, not always, offer an explanation for what drove the jump. So we're going to look. We're going to look for these articles. We have a systematic process to find these articles in uh, leading national newspapers. Then our trained humans will read the article, and here's what they're extracting from the article. First, they want to identify the primary reason for the stock market jump, according to the journalist. Then they classify that reason into one of 17 categories. One possible category, as in the first example we looked at, is there's no explanation offered or the journalist explicitly says it's unknown, nobody knows. We also classify the secondary reason for the jump if one is offered. We quantify journalist confidence as to their explanation on a three-point scale. We also quantify the reader's ease of coding on a three-point scale. And finally, we identify and record the geographic origin of the market moving news, okay? So that's, that's an overview of the method. Now, why look at big jumps? Well, I've already explained it, it, it picks up a big, a big share of all the uh, overall volatility in the market. Second is practical. Newspapers have been around for a long time. They're readily available on online archives. And for jumps of the size we look at, they tip, they, you typically will find a newspaper article. In terms of the scale and scope of what we do, we're gonna look at over 6,000 jumps. These are all extreme events in 16 national stock markets. So it's, an, that, so it's a very large scale given that we're doing this um, in a, with a manual uh, structured reading. And we're gonna use these newspaper articles to assess the proximate cause of these stock market jumps, clarity as to the cause, and I'll explain how we do that, and the ge geographic source of the market moving news. Here's an overview of the key findings. First, policy-driven jumps are distinctive in multiple respects. First, they drive a higher share of upward than downward jumps in every country we look at. And the difference is big, okay? This pattern, moreover, this pattern is strengthened over time. So in recent decades, there's an even greater propensity for policy to drive upward market jumps compared to non-policy sources of market moves. There's also a very interesting relationship between the policy share of upward jumps and recent past stock market performance. And basically when the stock market's been doing bad in the previous three months, you're more likely to get a policy a piece of policy news that triggers an upward stock market jump. Now, the type of jump also matters for post-jump volatility. And the most striking um, result in this regard involves monetary policy. So in the wake of jumps that are attributed contemporaneously to monetary policy, market volatility over the next 30 days is systematically lower than it is after other jumps. And that's also true conditional on a battery of controls. And that effect is quite big. Third point is clarity also matters. Greater clarity as to the reason for a jump today foreshadows lower future volatility uh, than jumps that are unclear, okay? In addition, we show that clarity about what's happening to the stock market has trended upwards over the past 90 years in both the United States and the United Kingdom. And the, the last key result that uh, I'll talk about today is there's an extraordinary role for the United States that's unlike any other country. And it's of the following sort. If you look at all the countries in our sample, excluding the United States, what you find is leading newspapers in those countries attribute about one third of the stock market jumps in their own national stock markets to news that uh, relates from or originates from relates to or originates from the United States. So one third of jumps around the world are in response to US related news. And Europe, which accounts for a larger share of global output has nothing like that kind of effect. The corresponding number for Europe is more like 5%. And China also has nothing like that, that effect. So there's really an extraordinary role for the US in this regard. Um, a little bit more about methodology. So here's another example. Uh, this is a recent example from this year during the coronavirus pandemic. The S&P 500 index in the U.S. fell more than 4% 4, 4 on February 27th. We go read the article and we see what they say. It's pretty clear that in this article that um, the journalist thinks that the reason for the drop was bad news about the coronavirus. Okay, so that in our, in our classification gets classified as 
other non-policy, and then we specify what it is, coronavirus, the geographic source is the United States, China, and South Korea, because those are the three <clears throat> regions of the world or countries in the world that the article talks about in connection with this bad news that's pushing down the market. In this particular article, the journalist is quite confident in their tone, in their word choice about what, why they think the market um, uh, fell. So we have co code confidence is high. And this is, a, this is a relatively easy article to code. Here's another example, this one involving government spending. I'll just go over this quickly. Um, this was during the uh, financial crisis. This was um, bad news in the sense that the first, the government's bailout plan, I think this was TARP 1, if you remember, was uh, rejected by Congress and that caused the market to plunge um, by nearly 9%. So <clears throat> here's, the categorical, here's the categorical distribution of jumps um, in our sample. <clears throat> And this is ordered with policy related categories at the top. And within policy related categories, we've ordered them from the most prevalent jumps in the post war period to the less prevalent jumps. So, monetary policy <clears throat> jumps are the most prevalent type of policy driven jump in the post war period. Uh, government spending would be the second most prevalent, and so on. And this, the bottom half of the chart looks at the non policy categories. Macro, news about the macroeconomy, macroeconomic news and outlook is by far the most common type of jump um, in the post-war period, accounting for more than 30% of all the jumps in the sample. And then at the bottom, you can see there's a sizable um, fraction um, of the jumps where there's no explanation offered or the journalist just says outright, as in the example we started with, that nobody knows. Okay, and that's... that's um, more than 20% before uh, World War II, but, uh, but about 12% in the post-war period. At this point in the talk, you might be thinking, why use human coders? This seems like a massive um, application of um, human time and effort, and it is. Um, so why not use an automated method? You know, we've tried that. There are considerable challenges um, in the kind of classification exercise that we're doing. Um, one is that sometimes there's economics knowledge we want to bring to bear that would be hard to capture in an algorithm, um, like Taylor rule distinctions between um, macro news and macro news that move that causes a change in monetary policy through a well-defined uh, monetary policy reaction function. We'd call both of those macro news, even though one gets transmitted through monetary policy. Second, there's language variation, which we could try to address in an automated way, but which is somewhat challenging. So think about the term trade war. war. War there doesn't really mean anything about sovereign military conflicts. It means something about trade policy. And then there's, there's context. Um, the German man is, is from a headline, I think, on a magazine where the picture on the magazine is Adolf Hitler. Now there's that's, that's kind of ironic in a few senses. First, Hitler was from Austria, not Germany. But second, a computer algorithm will have a hard time picking out that German man and figuring out this is an article about uh, a nefarious world leader, not something else. But last, um, trainable classification algorithms, um, they require many observations on which to train them. And so if you only have a few observations, you're not gonna get very good results. So you, you can think of our exercise as an input into ultimately developing um, an automated classification algorithm, um, but being trained on the expert classifications that we're generating. Um, but that, I won't say much more today about um, automated algorithms unless somebody asks me. Now let's talk a little bit about other concerns you might have, um, including uh, uh, the reliability of this approach. So I'm gonna talk about some, very quickly some um, reliability and um, validation exercises. <clears throat> so one, one concern is about the reliability of the human coders. Um, are they doing a good and sensible job? Um, and even what does that mean? Uh, so one, the way we've tackled this is we, we look at many newspapers in the United States and you can see um, on, the ver on the right vertical scale, that's the average number of days excuse me, that's the average number of newspapers that we consulted for jumps in the indicated year. 
and the, the circles are proportional to the number of jumps in the year. And then on the left vertical scale, you can see the average number of people that we had reading newspaper articles on that day. And so what you, what you see here, the basic point is we are consulting multiple newspapers per day. So we can look to see whether uh, the, the extent of agreement across newspapers about the reason for a given jump. And we're also having multiple people read newspapers, newspaper articles for the same jump and often multiple people who are reading the same article from the same newspaper. Um, and these are people who are working independently. Um, the assignment of articles to people and newspapers to people is random. So, there, so that's some kind of details in the background here. But what all this gives us is a way to assess systematically um, how much agreement rate there is. So if we look across all jumps for all, all human readers, all coders and all newspapers, and we just do a binary classification uh, between policy and non-policy, we get a 75% agreement rate um, in the pre-war period and an 80% agreement rate in the post-war period. If we look at our seven, if we look just within the Wall Street Journal, which turns out perhaps not surprisingly to be the newspaper that typically has the clearest, best written articles. So we're taking the cross newspaper disagreement off the table and we're just looking at cross people within newspaper uh, disagreement across our 17 granular categories, we get a 77% agreement rate. Now random assignment would generate a 12% agreement rate. So clearly we're doing much, much better than random, even though there's not perfect agreement. There's a bunch of other validation exercises in the paper. I'm not gonna have time to talk about them here today. There's a, a wide variety. I will just note though, there's kind of a proof in the pudding validation that I'll come back to, which is our newspaper classifications have predictive power for some aspects of stock market behavior. So, so that in itself says there's, there's information value in this classification algorithm, even if it's not perfect. All right, let me get to some of the key results. And my, my watch has inconveniently stopped while I'm uh, giving this presentation. So I'm gonna, <laughs> check my, my clock on the computer just to, uh, just to um, see how I am with time. And maybe Simon, if you can give me a five minute warning. Okay, well. sure. Yeah, you have about 15 minutes left. Okay, great. So here is a plot from 1900 to 2020 with a policy non-policy breakdown of jumps in the United States. Uh, you can see that the policy share is not really trended over time. But you can also see more interestingly in this chart, there are some periods characterized by extraordinary volatility. And there are many periods characterized by this metric by, by very quiescent markets, okay? And we've lived through in, in 2020, one of the uh, periods of extraordinary volatility. Now, here's, here's one of the distinctive aspects of policy jumps. So th this, pick, this chart makes three points. So let me walk you through them one at a time. So uh, there's, this is broken down into two different time periods. I've got daily stock market return on jump days on the horizontal scale. And then I have the share of the jumps um, in that bin. Uh, this is a bin scatter. Share of jumps in that bin that were attributed to policy, okay, under our human classification. The first thing to note is that <clears throat> upward jumps are more likely to be attributed to, to policy than downward jumps. Okay, you can see that that's especially true in the post-war period, but it was also true in the, in, in the, since 1980, but it was also true in the first 80 years of our sample. So that's, that's the first observation. Second observation is that you see an upward slope so that even um, if you just look at upward jumps, you see that bigger upward jumps are more likely to be associated with uh, to more likely be driven by policy related news. So that's the upward slope that you see here. And then you see that the slope got steeper. Okay, so that's the, that's the third point I want you to take away from this chart that the propensity for policy to drive upward jumps has, has become greater uh, over time. Okay, so that's already a very distinctive aspect of policy driven stock market jumps. Uh, to my knowledge, this is a completely uh, new finding uh, in the literature. Now, this pattern holds in every country in our sample, okay? And here I'm just showing you the raw data. If you look at the rightmost two columns, you just see a listing of 
um, negative and positive, the number of negative and positive policy jumps in each country. And in every single country, there's more positive jumps that are driven by policy than negative ones. On the left, and this is not a general feature of the data, by the way, the leftmost two columns in this chart show you the non-policy jumps. And there you see a very different pattern. Non-policy jumps tend to be negative. So there's something quite distinctive about policy jumps. It holds across every country in our sample. So it's highly unlikely to be due to just the way newspapers operate in a particular country. Now, a more subtle point, um, and this is, this is true in the United States and the United Kingdom where we have enough data to kind of investigate this issue. This is a complicated table. So I'm just gonna summarize the messages in words. The worst the, worst the stock market has performed in the, in the 66 trading days prior to a jump day. So 66 trading days, roughly three months. The greater is the likelihood of getting a positive policy jump. And that's true conditional on a battery of controls for past volatility and for the uh, size and direct, uh, the, the, the size and direction of the existing jump, okay? So there's an aspect of counter cyclicality in these policy driven stock market jumps. And that aspect of counter cyclicality has also grown stronger over time. Okay, it's stronger in the post war period. It's mainly due to monetary policy and fiscal policy actions, not other types of policy jumps, which suggests that it might be some consequence of conscious uh, stabilization policy uh, efforts by policymakers. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, as I mentioned there, this proof of pudding form of validation, um, here's an example of that. Jumps that are classified as monetary policy, as due to monetary policy, foreshadow lower volatility over the next 20 some trading days in the market. Okay. And that's what you see on this chart. So we, I've just divided jumps into two categories. There's jumps attributed to monetary policy. This is US data, by the way. That's about 10% of all the jumps. And then I put all the other jumps in the, in the other category. And this is just showing you um, the um, <clears throat> volatility day by day, the average volatility for all the, over the whole sample, day by day after the jump for these two categories of jumps, monetary policy and everything else. They're high, there's, a high, there's a big statistically significant difference uh, between monetary policy jumps and other jumps uh, in this respect. Uh, the magnitude's large. This is, a, if I remember right, about a one standard deviation difference. Um, uh, so that's a big deal. In fact, there is, as you might guess, volatility tends to be higher in the wake of jumps than other days just because we know from many studies that volatility is steerly correlated over time. But this monetary policy effect is, is, a, is so big, it essentially wipes out that effect, okay? Now, that suggests that the nature of monetary policy jumps has something to do about uncertainty resolution, maybe because there's an FOC, FOMC meeting that resolves whether the Fed's going to tighten or loosen, for example. Whereas other jumps appear to be ex uncertainty accentuating, at least on average. Okay, so that's that's one example. And again, I want to stress, this is a predictive. This is predictive value of the classifications, even after we've controlled for standard HAR controls, which are, you know, volatility past day, week, and month. That's a standard in this literature, and the size and direction of the jump itself. So there appears to be real information in this classification that would be hard to extract otherwise. Now let me move beyond the individual categories and try to speak to the clarity uh, or the perceived clarity of why the market moved the way it did. And we actually have four different quantitative indicators that help us get at that. One is how much agreement there is across humans and newspapers about a particular jump. And the idea is if it's unclear why the market moved, there's going to be a lot of disagreement across newspapers and it's going to, and journalists are tend to kind of be wishy-washy, go back and forth. So we'll get low pairwise agreement rates across newspapers and across readers. Ease of coding has a similar motivation. If the journalist is very confident about what happened and why, they'll say it in the very first sentence 
and they'll say it very the very first sentence in the article and very clear. And so it's an easy article to code. They'll also say it with authority, you know, with a lot of authority and confidence. That's the confidence. And then finally, we have this uh, the, just the share of articles that are unknown. What you see in these four pictures is there's a trend here. Okay, um, all of them point towards greater clarity over time. And we, we, in our paper, we talk about why we think that's happened. There's been, there's been a tr dramatic improvement in the timeliness, accuracy, and depth of economic statistics. There's been a tremendous improvement in, um, in corporate earnings reporting and so on. So we, we talk about these things in the paper. I'm not gonna have time to go into them here, but what we do is we take these four components and we standardize each one to uh, uh, you know, zero, uh, zero mean, unit standard deviation, and then we just sum them up and we get our clarity index. So here's our overall clarity index that shows this upward trend. If you look at the highest and lowest clarity days in our sample, that's what I picked out here. You can see on the left, that's, a, that's the lowest clarity day in our, in our sample, in our, in, at least since 1985. And you see the markets bouncing all around. And the highest clarity day, um, it's another example where the market jumped very abruptly in the wake of a monetary policy announcement. Clarity, as we measured, is, is um, serially correlated over time. So here, what we've done is divide the sample into high clarity days and low clarity days. Um, and, uh, in, and then, excuse me, we divided the sample into all years and post-war years. But within each one of those time periods, we show the um, average uh, value of clarity around a jump and where, where it's either a low clarity jump or a high clarity jump. And you can see that in the red lines, which is systematically above the blue lines, that's just saying that both before and after low clarity jumps, um, you tend to have low clarity uh, 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 as well. So this is, just a, this is just a graphical way of saying clarity itself is serially correlated. Now, greater clarity measured as I just described, is also associated with lower volatility in the future after you condition on standard controls for past, vo past volatility. So everybody who works on asset prices knows there's serial correlation of volatility. The statement I'm making here is even after you condition on that serial correlation volatility, if today's jump is of low clarity, then that should cause you to revise upwards your uh, estimate of future stock market volatility. Um, <clears throat> policy jumps tend to be high clarity relative to non-policy jumps. That's particularly true for sovereign military policy jumps, you know, war events and so on. Um, but it's also quite strikingly true for uh, monetary policy jumps. The green is the, the histogram of clarity for monetary policy jumps, and that's compared to all non-policy jumps, okay? So policy jumps tend to be clearer, and that's part of the reason why uh, monetary policy jumps are foreshadow uh, less, less volatility in the future. Okay. Excuse me, Steve, about five minutes left. Okay, great, thanks, Simon, I'm uh, doing just fine. So here's our um, sample of 16 countries, and the main sources, the, the time periods we covered, the main sources that, uh, newspaper sources that we consult in each country, and the jump threshold we set for each country. So we set a somewhat higher jump threshold in countries that have more volatile um, stock markets because we wanna get roughly the same number of jumps over periods of decades, uh, or the same jump rate in each, in each country. So this basically gets us about 3% of all trading days are meet, meet our jump threshold. Um, I showed you a picture like this for the US earlier back to 1900. Uh, the UK is the other country where we go way back in time, uh, 1930 in this case. Once again, you see that there are these long periods with quiescent stock markets and then periods with extraordinary uh, volatility. If you, were, if you remember what the US picture looked like, it looks pretty, it looks different than this one. Um, here, the, the, the big volatility episode isn't the 1930s. It's the 1970s, okay, when, when you know, the, U, the UK had a rough time. Um, <clears throat> now, here's our, here's our most important and striking result um, from the international data. So 
let me tell you what's going on in this chart. The two solid lines, the black line shows the share of global output accounted for by European countries. The red dotted line shows the share of global output accounted for by the United States. Okay, so they're both big. The US number is below the European number. Uh, and then what you see are the red dots. These are look at countries, look at third party countries, neither US nor European countries and ask what share of jumps in those countries in that year did their newspapers attribute to US related news developments. That's what the red dots are showing you. Dot size is proportional to the number of jumps, the average number of jumps um, across countries in that year. And then the black circles, the black open circles do the same thing for Europe. Again, looking at third party countries. The picture tells a remarkable story, which is even though Europe accounts for a bigger share of global output, the United States accounts for a far larger share of or US related news drives a much larger share of stock market jumps in other countries than does Europe. The number is about 35% for the United States. It's about five and a half percent for Europe. If we bring the European countries into the picture and just look at the US share, we still get the same result. So European countries are also responding remarkably to US related news. So this is, we see this as adding to this literature, which has been quite active in recent years about the uniquely important role that the United States plays in the international monetary and financial system, both with, with respect to the dollar and with respect to uh, Fed monetary policy. And here we're adding another dimension to that literature saying in equity markets as well, the United States plays a role unlike any other country or region of the world. Now, I don't show China on this chart, but if you look at China, basically the, the rest of the world pays no attention to, to China until the mid nineties. And then it begins increasing. In the, la in the last several years, you do see that China has clearly become the second most important source of news developments that drive stock market developments in third party countries. Okay, I'll skip the conclusion slide. I'll, I'll make one last application of this to methodology to um, COVID-19. So one nice thing about our about this exercise, and we, we see it as basically generating data that can be used for many, many studies. Um, the data are online. I'll show you the, uh, I'll show you the uh, web, web page in a minute. But one application that we made um, is to try to understand the reaction of stock markets to COVID. So what you see in this picture is um, the first basically 120 years of our sample for the United States. We went and asked how many big stock market jumps were according to next day newspaper accounts caused by pandemics or policy responses to pandemics. The answer is zero. Zero, that's kind of extraordinary when you think about what we've been through in the last year. Even in the Spanish flu, there are no newspaper accounts that attribute major market moves to what was happening to the flu. Um, in this period, in you know, the first quarter of, um, roughly the first quarter of 2020 in the United States, you can see that there was a huge number, there's a huge number of jumps and vast majority of them were attributed to the pandemic or policy responses to the pandemic. Now in work with Simon and uh, our co-author Dean Chien Lu, we find the same is true, the same pattern holds in China. We, we only go back to 1990 in China, but you see the same pattern in China. So I just leave you with this point. The behavior of the stock market in reaction to the pandemic, the COVID pandemic is unlike the behavior of the stock market in reaction to any previous pandemic that we have data for. If you want to make use of our data or learn more about our project, go to the stockmarketjumps.com page. We've, I think we've got all the jumps for the Wall Street Journal online already. We update this continuously in, in real time and we'll eventually put all of, the, all of the data on this website. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Steve, for giving us such a great talk. Now let's uh, get some questions. I already see uh, the first question from Tarek. Tarek, do you want to turn our video and ask your questions? Sorry, me. I, I my, my video is okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I, I I wonder if if the uh, disproportionate role of the U.S. here could be a language issue that just like information about the U.S. is just much more easily accessible. 
so, so have you found like a similar overweighting for UK and Ireland or you know, other English speaking countries? Mm, we haven't looked explicitly at, at that, but I don't think so. Um, be, for, you know, for one thing, as I said, the, if you look at the last decade, the role of China has clearly kind of become the second most important and Chinese is a pretty opaque language to non-Chinese speakers. So I, I don't, that suggests to me that language isn't really the barrier. Um, and, so, so, and, you know, there's lots of information about countries like Germany and France and Spanish speaking countries that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who can, who are conversant enough in those languages to make sense of the news. And there's lots of news sources. I, we can do the exercise you're suggesting. Uh, I don't think, I don't think that's it. The Tarek is a great question of the Europe as a whole is extremely underweight and just from casual empiricism, many of the European articles are about European things. So I think it's not going to pan out. You're right. That's a great way to test the language. Thing. So I'm pretty sure given Europe has a very low weight and within Europe, UK and Ireland and not particularly frequent, I suspect they'll look below their sizes. But yeah, you're right. That's a great way, in fact, to kind of strike off the language hypothesis. Thanks, Derek. Okay, uh, Matt here. Hi, uh, I wrote the question down so that, uh, you know, it's clear to everyone. Uh, so I guess there are many war-related, uh, uh, military-related, but it would be true for any other development, even like COVID or, you know, whether you name it, uh, many jumps that sometimes reflect, uh, sometimes reflect better than expected news, sometimes reflect obviously worse than expected news. So obviously it's news about that particular event that you classified, but you, my question is like, are they all classified as what really jumps or there's also an additional classification that you have in the paper somewhere where you distinguish the tone of the news? And related to this, what happens if uh, say, the news is good, but the market goes down. You know, it was happening all the time with the COVID, for instance. You know, the, the market was over-interpreting everything as good and, you know, could have jumped in either direction. And the journalist himself is confused when he has to report. So what would the coder do in such a case? So thanks for the questions. A few things. Um, we, we aren't coding a standard measure of sentiment, although obviously we kind of selected up or down jumps, they're extreme. So there's usually some sentiment overlay. The market goes up by 4%, you know, you're not likely to get a downbeat sentiment. Um, so that's why we're coding things that are cl closer to uh, clarity rather than uh, a traditional notion of sentiment. We, we do sometimes see examples along the lines you just suggested where the news is good or seems to be good, um, but the market goes down. And those, you know, those will often show up in the kind of head scratching category um, and get coded. They'll either get coded as unknown or when they are coded with a specific, um, <clears throat> a specific um, cause, the journalist confidence coding will be low. Okay, so we have, we have kind of multiple ways to kind of get at this, um, this kind of lack of clarity about, about what's going on. Now, the last thing you said is interesting. I want to just which I think is a different kind of statement. You say, well, the market's over-interpreting what happened. Um, that may be right, but over-interpret over -interpret means relative to some model you have in your head. And um, I think there's no doubt, in fact, Simon and I have a paper that makes this point, that the market overreacted to COVID news relative to what you would get out of a standard macro asset pricing model. So we actually, do, we actually have a little exercise that we just take Barrel's rare disasters model and use it to interpret realized outcomes rather than kind of ex ante premiums. We make exactly that point. So yes, markets do seem to overreact relative, overinterpret some news, but that's relative to a model that we have in our head. And so, you know, one one possibility is people are behaving irrationally, in some broad sense. The other possibility is we have the wrong model in our head. Um, <laughs> I don't have an answer to that question, but but I do see these data that you know, Nick, Scott, and Marco and I have developed as um, giving us some uh, fodder for addressing that kind of question that you're raising. Okay, I, I see.
many questions going on here. Uh, I'll go start with George, then Wojak, then Camilla. Okay, George, uh, please uh, ask your questions. Great, um, it's a really interesting paper. Um, I'll sort of follow up on Tarek's comment in terms of the the, uh, the business cycle co-movements is, is kind of the way I'll think about it. I mean, there's, there's a pretty large literature that sort of relates co-movement across countries to you know, economic fundamentals that, um, and I think GDP is not necessarily the way we'd want to be looking at this. And so, you know, it's really about like, you know, how connected you are through trade. And so, you know, an alternative way of looking at, at um, and maybe you have this in the paper is to sort of run some sort of gravity type regressions and sort of see how much extra is the U.S. of, um, you know, explaining kind of these, these cross-country movements. Because um, we, we do know that like countries that trade together more, um, you know, have more synchronized business cycles. So you would expect that that's kind of the, the thing that we should be controlling for, not just like the abs absolute size of these, these two blocks, right? Um, so it's more of a suggestion, I guess. Yeah, I, I take the point. Um, I think what we showed you, what I showed you in the picture is in a sense of very crude gravity yep. uh, control. You know, I've got the US European comparison. And even though I could do more refined versions of that, I think it's pretty apparent from the picture that's not going to take us very far. Um, you know, just an overall economic mass, Europe, Europe is bigger than, uh, than uh, uh, the United States. And I think, you know, we could do this. I think Europe is actually closer on average distance wise to, to most of our third party countries uh, than, than is the United States. So I'm not saying there's nothing to the gravity story. In fact, we went down that path early on and we said, look, you know, that's why we said, let's do the comparison to Europe. This must just because in part, at least the US is big, but that, uh, that, that's, not, that's not mainly what's going on. It's something else that's special about the US. And an another comment on this is, you see that even as the US share of global GDP has diminished, and it's it diminished a lot in recent decades, um, its share of, of it, its, its role in driving stock market jumps in 30, third party countries has, has, if anything, increased a bit. It's a little hard to tell if there's a trend because the, the, glo the, the global financial crisis was you know, initially a US centered event. And so there's that big big spike upwards or in 2008, 2009 in uh, glo global market movements attributable to the US. So again, that suggests it's not really gonna, a gravity story isn't really gonna play out very, very well in this setting. And, it, and what we haven't pushed, I think hard enough on yet is, is well, what about the other ways in which the, the US is special? And those, those, those basically have to do with the dollar and with the, uh, the, the role of the Fed as the central bank, the, the central bank for the world. Um, so, I, so there, I think the answer is probably buried there more than traditional trade-like gravity models. Okay, now, the wait. other thing to be, the other thing to be said, I forgot to say that, you know, the U.S. in the post-war period has also played a unique role in all kinds of global institutions. Um, you know, from the United Nations, the WTO. Uh, NATO and so on. So uh, the IMF. So the, the U.S. has, aside from just the the dollar and the Fed, and I realize this has been changing over time, uh, but nonetheless, th that that's another sense in which the U.S. role. And the, think about the U.S. propensity for good or ill for foreign military interventions. You know, sovereign military actions drive a non-trivial share of stock market jumps and. I think it's fair to say nobody's in, no, no other country is involved in even a fraction of the sovereign military actions that the United States is in a leading capacity. So there are lots of, there's lots of respects in which the U.S. is quite distinct apart from its large share of, of global output and global trade. Okay, uh, Wojak, please go ahead with our question. Uh, yeah, I have two minor methodological reflections, perhaps maybe relevant for the future, maybe not. The first is about the human validation. Humans are humans and make mistakes. So that there's probably some sort of noise here due to the human validation. Hence, it is going to be inevitably a question in the future to what extent these results are robust to a human validation or to the choice of the validators. Our current experience is showing that the validation through 
latent Dirichlet allocation or something like this is equally good and probably cheaper than human validation. But anyway, to give it to two different bunches of validators and to check to what extent the different, there are differences between them might be interesting. Second is about a possible uh, crowding out effect here for the identification of the smaller jumps particularly relevant. If at the same time something important happens, then the coverage in the newspapers of a particular jump must, might be biased by the fact that it was a Super Bowl or it was in some sort of regional event which might crowd out the financial news, even in the financial newspapers. A show you have uh, Irish Times, for instance, in one of the newspapers. Probably, sometimes, financial news might be crowded out by football, some sort of border disputes, and whatever else, and sometimes not. So maybe there might be a, some way of accounting for these crowding out effects. So th thanks for those questions and comments, all, all good ones. Let me, let me try to take them one at a time. There's no doubt there's errors in human codings. Um, we, we, we work pretty hard to address that in multiple ways. First, as you saw in one of the slides that I put up pre for, uh, quickly, you know, we have about 10 different reads by different humans for the average US jump. So we already have, we have that, that gives us two things we can do. One, we can average across the human reads that obviously mitigates the noise. Second, we can um, look at the disagreement rates across coders. Let me tell you a bit about the mechanics of how we run these. We run them in teams and, and our team, we meet frequently with the teams. The coders know that they will not be the only one coding a particular article. So they have that, that's partly a quality check on our part and it's partly an incentive motivation uh, mechanism for them. Because one of the things we do in these meetings and these are typically meetings with college students, is we say, okay, John, you coded this one monetary policy. Mary, you coded it trade policy. John and Mary, give us your explanations and tell us why. We have a little discussion. If John screwed up, he's embarrassed. He doesn't want to screw up again, you know, especially if he's embarrassed, especially if he likes Mary and he's trying to impress her with how, how smart he is. <laughs> okay, so we have things we do to try to uh, uh, mitigate the issues you are describing. Um, but still, they're, they're, they're no doubt they're present um, on, the, on the human classification side. Now, you mentioned briefly using an automated algorithm. I invite anyone who wants to take our data, um, which we put online, and come up with an automated algorithm. We, it, it's quite challenging here. Um, and let me briefly say why. Uh, first, we're not doing a binary or trinary classification. We have a 17-way classification. Second. I'll use trade policy as an example. Before Donald Trump became president, there were only about, I <clears throat> can't remember the exact number, six or seven jumps in the previous 115 years in our sample that we classified as trade policy. Now, Donald Trump generated a lot more, okay? So now we have at least twice that many. Um, but what that says is <clears throat> there simply aren't enough jumps to think about using an automated algorithm um, to capture some of our more uh, our, our, our smaller categories. We have tried to take um, automated methods and apply them to coarser classifications like macro would be a category because that's our biggest category. Say break it down into three or four categories. There, some interesting patterns emerge. First, we still don't get nearly as high quality a classification as the human approach. Second, what you see though, is that the quality of the machine generated classifications uh, improve over time. And they improve over time, basically because newspaper articles have become better written. Okay, they may also be just, uh, you know, optical scanning issues. And we see this in our, in our own analysis. If you go back to newspaper articles written in the early decades of the 20th century about the stock market, they're rambling, they're all over the place. Uh, they're not very professional. Um, whereas if you look at more recent decades, especially if you look at something like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, the articles are written in a more kind of logical approach. And the, the, the machine learning automated type methods do better in that setting. They still don't do as well as humans, at least not, not by our criteria, but they do better. So 
I, 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 I offer a challenge to anyone who's listening and wants to take up that challenge. If you can develop an automated algorithm does, that does some part of our classification exercise, at least as well as we do with humans, I'd love to see it. Uh, I think it's a lot harder than it appears. This is, a, this is not the kind of classification exercises that typically have high success rates with off the shelf classification algorithms. So, uh, uh, so anyway, but we, we are trying and, and but it's, it's harder than it looks uh, on the surface, I think. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we, we still have many questions. I encourage you to type those questions and comments in the chat box. And let's give a big proud for Steve. Thanks. Thanks for the great questions too. Okay, uh, now uh, let's begin our first session. Claudiana from Bank of France will be moderator. Steve, if you can stop sharing, please. Doing that right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve and Simon. I'm very happy to, to moderate the first the first session. It's, it's a very nice transition. We'll still we'll be uh, hearing uh, more about policy uncertainty. So we have three presentations. Uh, as a reminder, we have 25 minutes for the speakers, for the presenters, and 10 minutes for Q&A. Please uh, uh, keep your questions for, for the end. Then either uh, if you prefer to write it on the chat or uh, to raise your hand and, and I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the turn. Uh, we will start, the first will be Martina Yasova from Barnard College, Columbia University on policy uncertainty, lender of last result and the real economy. Please, uh, Martina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Claudiana, for the introduction. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for including our paper into the program of the conference. Can you all see my slides? Well, wow. okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, Lender of last issue policy uncertainty and the real economy. And this is a joint work with Caterina Mendicino from the European Central Bank and Dominic Supera from World Bank. All right, so following up on uh, Steve's uh, keynote, uh, he has mentioned one of the things that, one thing that he has observed is that uh, monetary policy shocks are oftentimes related to uncertainty resolutions. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in this paper. So let me motivate it a little bit more. So uh, if you look into um, the central bank's reaction to the global financial crisis, but also into what the central banks have done in the past year, we have seen central banks reviving a lender of last resort policies and implementing new temporary or permanent changes to their liquidity operations. At the same time, uh, if you think about this, these central bank actions were largely surrounded by a substantial policy uncertainty. Now, one thing that's very interesting about these lender of last resort policies is that we know very little about them. If you look into uh, existing evidence on other policy uncertainties, such as political uncertainty, trade uncertainty, or direct monetary policies, so each, uh, interest rate uncertainty, and their effect on either firm level or aggregate economic outcomes, much more is known and well documented in the literature. And many people in this audience have, have worked a lot on these specific topics. Now, uh, with that said, we actually don't know all that much about other things that central banks do that are unrelated to the monetary policy. And that's the lender of last resort policy uncertainty that I wanna talk about today. So what, what exactly do we do? In the paper, we essentially ask two uh, questions. The main question is, how does a reduction in lender of last resort policy uncertainty affect bank lending? And then secondly, we are interested in knowing what are the implications for the real economy. Now, as I mentioned, there's very little empirical evidence in this field, and that is primarily attributed to both the identification and the data challenges. So on the identification side, the, the biggest issue is um, an idea to find an exogenous shock to the policy uncertainty. And ideally, because we are interested in knowing uh, the LOLR uh, uncertainty effects on lending, you might want to be able to disentangle the impact on the demand for credit from the supply. Uh, so that's, that's the identification part. Secondly, if you think about the data challenges, it can be particularly difficult to measure the exposure of the policy uncertainty in the cross-section of both uh, banks and firms in the economy. So in this paper, what we're doing is that we address these challenges by looking directly into Europe. 
And specifically, we are using a unique policy change uh, introduced by the European Central Bank in 2011, which is the very long term refinancing operations, oftentimes abbreviated as the VLTRO. Now, I'll talk about the VLTRO a little bit later today, but generally we'll think about it as a quasi natural experiment to a sudden reduction in the lender of last resort policy uncertainty. And the key feature that the policy has done is that it has extended the maturity on the central bank liquidity from a very short term, so think weekly, monthly, or free monthly, up to extraordinarily long three-year maturity. Now, this policy as such in and of itself is not going to deliver you uh, the full result. What is really important is the environment at which this policy has happened. So the timing is inc incredibly important. And I'm going to show you that this policy was introduced at times when the central bank was offering substantial haircut subsidy. Again, I'll explain what the haircut subsidy essentially means in our setup, but basically we observe that there's this large gap between the type of funding or the cost of funding that the banks can get from the private market and the central bank. So there's a big uncertainty in the economy prior to the policy announcement about the, the amount of funding you can get from uh, the markets. And then this policy comes in and it in part resolves the uncertainty about the future cost of uh, financing for banks. So that's what we're going to do on the side of the experiment. Now, on the side of the data, we're going to go deeper into one specific European country, and that's the case of Portugal. And we'll um, build a novel micro-level data set that is merging proprietary information from the ECB on the monetary policy, detailed information from the private repo markets, and then we're going to use the credit registry as well as additional firm-level data in uh, the country of Portugal. So in the paper, we do lots of things, and today I won't have time to talk about everything that's covered there. So let me, before jumping into some specific results, give you the main preview of findings. So the main result of the paper is that we show that the reduction on the lender of last resort policy uncertainty uh, positively affects bank lending, and it also propagates to a higher investment and employment of firms in the economy. Now, in terms of the channel, we link this with the real option channel of uh, policy uncertainty. Now, the real option channel has been largely documented to be an important uh, transmission mechanism in case of firms or largely incorporate finance. But the novelty of this paper is that we show that the real option channel uh, is also relevant for banks. And the story goes as follows. So there's an uncertainty about the future nature of the lender of last resort funding, which means that the banks prefer to wait and see and they delay the illiquid investment. So they delay the lending. Now, the policy, the VLTR policy get introduced, especially in this high uncertainty environment, which means that we observe a decrease in the policy uh, uncertainty, which intensifies the firms to no longer postpone their lending and actually start providing more credit uh, to the real economy, which finally uh, is reflected in the real level outcomes such as investment and uh, employment. So in the paper, we track this down in a couple of levels. We start with the credit registry and we first document the effects on the loan level. And we show a couple of things. So we start with the intensive margin and we show that banks that are more exposed to the reduction of policy uncertainty uh, start uh, issuing more credits to their existing borrowers. On the extensive margin, we saw that these exposed banks are also now approving higher share of loan applications, and they are less likely to terminate their existing loans. In terms of firm level heterogeneity, we document stronger effects for firms that are smaller, riskier, or that, that have shorter relationship with a bank. In addition to all these quantitative results, we also look into the effect on the maturity. And in line with the real option channel, we find that banks are actually more moving into this illiquid investment, which is reflected here in the stronger results for the longer maturity of loans, which is a case of both in the loan uh, issuance, but also in the renegotiations. And finally, on the flip side, we also show that this uh, reduction in the lender of last resort policy uncertainty is associated with a temporary loosening of the lending standards. And so we track these newly approved loans down the time, and we observe that we see higher default rates on these loans three years down the line, uh, down the line after they have been approved. So these are some of the loan level results. The next thing we do in the paper is that we move on the firm level. And the first thing is that we aggregate the, the credit outcomes on the firm level. 
Now, one important thing that is in, uh, critical to mention here is that when we look into, say, Portugal in our setup, this is the period of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. So the credit has been largely contracting uh, in Europe. And so what we see is that this reduction in the lender of last resort policy uncertainty contributed to a slower pace of the credit contraction. And the size is economically uh, significant. And we see that uh, the credit contraction has slowed down by approximately 2.15 percentage points. Finally, in addition to all these credit outcomes, we link this more to firm level outcomes and we uh, document that there has been an increase in investment and for smaller businesses that are more reliant on banks as their primary source of financing, we also observe an increase in employment. All right, so for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you uh, much more about the lender of last resort policy uncertainty, as it's something that we probably don't talk about all that much. And I'm going to briefly introduce the data and empirical strategy, and I'm going to show you a couple of uh, results before I conclude. All right, so the lender of last resort policy uncertainty. So there are two critical ingredients that I uh, would like to emphasize so that we, we all uh, are on the same page. So the first thing is, Let's, uh, before the actual policy change happens, let's look into the general liquidity framework in Europe. So since the uh, global financial crisis, so since the Lehman collapse, the European Central Bank has started to offer unlimited liquidity to banks. And this unlimited uh, liquidity was provided in a policy called fixed rate full allotment. What this essentially means is that when banks place their bids to receive the funding, these bids are, all of the bids are uncompetitive. So all bids are fully satisfied, which means that the banks can borrow unlimited amount of liquidity from the central bank as long as they are able to pledge eligible collateral. Now, in December 2011, our VLTRO policy gets unexpectedly introduced. And as I've mentioned, the main feature of this policy is that it uh, offers, in addition to this existing short-term funding, which is usually weekly or monthly, it offers a possibility to borrow with a three-year uh, loan maturity. Now, importantly, if you think about this three-year funding, the cost of that financing and all other financial conditions are the same as if you were rolling over a short-term funding, meaning the interest rates are the same, the, the pool of eligible collateral is the same, et cetera, et cetera. With that said, what we see that, especially if you zoom up uh, for the full Eurozone, more than 800 European banks have participated in the VLTRO, and they have collectively bidded for more than 1 trillion euro in funding. And this gives us the largest liquidity uh, provision in the history of modern central banking worldwide. So let me show you what it means in our context of Portugal. So on the left um, graph, I'm showing you the liquidity that the Portuguese banks are getting from the ECB. The gray shaded area are all other shorter liquidity operations and the blue one is this VLTRO. And so one thing you can see is that at the policy announcement, so one thing you can see there are two uh, basically points when it happened. So the policy was ad adopted twice. So first in December and then in February. And you see that ba Portuguese banks essentially swapped most of their liquidity needs into this new very long-term operation. This is also reflected on the right-hand side when we plot the average maturity of the bank liabilities. And you see that in line with now borrowing with the loan maturity, the, the maturity profile of your liabilities is shooting up. Okay, so now the key question that really we need to put this all together is why was the VLTRO so popular given that the financing conditions were essentially the same? We argue in the paper that uh, at the time of the policy announcements, banks in Europe faced a substantial uncertainty about the possibility to get this fixed rate full allotment for an extended period of time. What I mean that the, although these uh, bids prior to the policy uh, announcement were uncompetitive and the ECB was provided an unlimited liquidity, it was very uncertain for how long such unlimited liquidity will be available to banks. And we corroborate this um, um, first bullet point in the paper by going through a number of both policy announcements by people at the ECB, but also the bank speeches and financial statements. And we see that uh, both the bankers and the central bankers uh, talk about this policy not being around for too long, and they express a certain uncertainty about the future nature of the central bank uh, lender of last resort policy. Now, why does this matter? It matters because if this... Uh, funding becomes unavailable, banks would need to go and borrow from the private markets instead. Now, the problem is that there are very different uh, financing conditions if you go and borrow on the market. And the main difference is the difference in haircuts. 
if you pledge these risky securities that European banks are holding on the uh, private market, you would need to face much larger haircuts. In other words, you would be able to borrow much less given your value of the pledge collateral. Now, in the graph, I'm showing you exactly the case that the Portuguese banks are facing. The blue line is showing you the haircuts that uh, Portuguese banks uh, would receive from the European Central Bank. The red line is showing you the evolution of haircuts that the Portuguese banks uh, face if they borrow only on the private market. Now, specifically, you see there was a big jump in summer 2011. And this is related to the fact that this was the time when the Portuguese government was downgraded by the rating agencies. And once the sovereign gets downgraded, all the banks and everybody else in the domestic economy that gets downgraded as well. And so, uh, following up the downgrade of the Portuguese sovereign, we see that if the banks go and pledge these types of government or bank bonds on the private market, they would see much steeper haircuts. Okay, good. So what we do in this paper is that we build uh, a novel data set that allows us to study this full transmission of the reduction of the lender of last uncertainty on the firm level outcomes. So we start with this lender of last resort data, which come both from the proprietary data set of the European Central Bank, where we observe the types of securities that their banks are pledging with the central bank to obtain this funding. And we also open, uh, match this information with the private market uh, operations. And for that, we use the, one of the um, clearing houses in Europe, which is the LCH ClearNet. Now we introduce additional bank level uh, data. And importantly, in the third bullet point, I mentioned that we have access to the universal loan level uh, credit registry that is in Portugal. So these are all bank loans that are larger than 50 euro. So we are essentially covering a large pool of uh, both small and larger businesses that are borrowing in the Portuguese economy. And finally, we match this information with the detailed information on the firm level annual census data, as well as the employee employer data set. Okay, so the key measure of this lender of last resort policy uncertainty for us is the haircut subsidy. And as I mentioned already, the haircut subsidy is this difference between the private market valuation and the ECB valuation. And the way we do it is that we compute it for each security S, so for each ISIN, uh, we sum it up on all the securities that the banks are actually holding, and we rescale it to the size of the bank, so to the size of the total asset. In other uh, words, this measures the reduction in the borrowing capacity in the extreme case when the bank needs to fully rely on the private market financing. And so one thing you can see is that the banks that are having the largest haircut get subsidy would benefit the most from the policy reduction uh, uncertainty. Now, in addition to these like large haircuts after they showed in the previous graph, one thing that is very important is that we observe a very significant cross-sectional variation in the haircuts actually at the bank level, which is gonna be the core for our empirical analysis. So in the, regarding the empirics, we use the difference in differences research design. So we essentially exploit the variation and the cross-section of the bank's exposure to the reduction on the lender of last resort policy uncertainty. So that's this, haircut subsidy. And we compare the dynamics of a firm, which is at the same time borrowing from two banks that are differently exposed to the monetary policy. This is something that's relatively standard in the empirical banking literature, and it allows us to control for firm level demand for credit. So a specific firm is having two different banks, which are differently exposed to the reduction in the LOLR uh, funding uncertainty. And we are able to control for the firm level uh, characteristics with the firm time fixed effect. Now, the identifying assumption here is that in the absence of the policy, the lending of the more and less exposed banks would have followed parallel trends. So let me show you some results. And for today, I'm going to show you the intensive margin. So we are, we are looking at the log value of the credit that the bank I is issuing to firm J at month T. We are saturating it with the firm time fixed effect. We are controlling for non-random bank uh, firm matching with the bank firm fixed effect. And then, as I mentioned, the core thing that we are interested in is this effect of the size of the haircut subsidy interacted with the post variable. So in the table here, we start with the simplest variation and we progressively saturate the model with the fixed effect until we actually reach the column five, which is uh, consistent with the equation I have on the top. 
So if we think about this coefficient, we can interpret it as a one standard deviation increase in the bank exposure to the reduction in lender of last resort policy uncertainty is associated with approximately 3.22% increase in lending on the intensive margin. Now, graphs are probably nicer than tables. So let me show you uh, the same thing now visually. And so you see a couple of things. So the first thing you see is that prior to the policy announcement, we see that the exposed and unexposed banks are generally uh, following uh, what appears to be parallel trends. Now, after the policy announcements, we see the divergence of the trends. And specifically, we see that the exposed banks are compared to the unexposed one issuing more credit. And this effect is both positive and persistent over time. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, we do a bunch of other things in the paper. Plus, we also do additional tests uh, in both in terms of identification and, and robustness to corroborate the findings that I've just mentioned to you. Martina, now, what I'm going to do. Five, you have five excellent. minutes. Excellent. So uh, the thing I want to use my last five minutes for is that I'd like to turn your attention to the firm level outcomes. So in the final part of the paper, we take these loan level outcomes and we are interested in knowing, okay, does this mean that I as a firm, when I can borrow from two different banks, am I simply switching from one bank to the other? Or am I as a firm actually receiving more credit following this reduction in the policy uncertainty? So we are interested in aggregating our loan level results to the firm level. And that's what we do here in the column one. So the, the problem with these types of specifications is that once you move to firm level regressions, you can no longer control for the demand for credit in the simple way. But there is a nice way uh, that you can apply a bias correction computation to actually clean this estimate of a potential demand effect. So that's what I'm showing right here. So you see that the estimate is uh, it's smaller, but it still continues to be positive and statistically significant. And we, the way you can give it some economic interpretation is as follows. In the time of the policy announcement, Portugal was in the quite a substantial uh, financial crisis. And so we observed that the credit contraction in this period has been approximately negative 5.75%. And using this data, we compute that in the absence of the policy, the credit contraction would have been even more severe by additional 2.15 percentage points, which is um, in terms of dollars or I'd say euros is roughly 900 uh, million euro more severe. Now, moving on from credit to real level outcomes. So the first thing is investment. So one thing we observe uh, is this positive and statistically significant coefficient on the effect on investment. And specifically this uh, effect is uh, present in terms of the small firms. Now to put this again into the context, once again, we are in the times of the crisis and the investment has been largely shrinking in the Portuguese economy. A year on year drop has been minus 18.5%. Now. To again contextualize this, we show that in the absence of such policy, the investment would have contracted by additional 2.2 percentage points. And finally, let me mention the effect on the employment. On the employment, we don't find any average effect of the haircut subsidy, but once you differentiate the firms into small and large, you see that there's a very strong effect on the small firms. And again, small firms are those that are primarily dependent on the bank financing as their primary source of um, external funding. And once again, we are in the time of crisis when the labor market has largely contracted by negative 9.7%. Uh, and we find that in the absence of the policy introduction, this contraction would have been even more, more severe by additional two percentage points. All right, so let me wrap up by saying that in this paper, we provide new insights into the transmission channel of the lender of last resort reduction in policy uncertainty to both bank lending and firm level outcomes. In terms of mechanism, we show that real option channel is not only important for firms, as we know from other literature, but is also very irrelevant for the banks. Now, we uh, show that uh, this uh, specific policy uh, is, has a, is, uh, is very relevant from the, from the policy design. What I mean is that if you look both in Europe and the US, the central bankers have tried to in, um, introduce new unconventional monetary policy measures to speed up lending to the real economy. What we're showing is that the policy that can address the uncertainty about the funding in itself can be a very powerful measure and can have not only positive credit effects, but also real economy outcomes. 
And finally, we argue that the design of such policy matters, especially it's not only that the long maturity is what is delivering you the, long, the, the result, but it's especially the fact that this policy was designed so that it addresses this alternative funding that has been provided by the private market, which has um, again contributed to the large uncertainty in the economy. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Martina. So if you have questions, please, please raise your hand or uh, write your question in the chat as well. Simon, yes, please. You are muted. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So uh, clearly your uh, great talk, right? So clearly your, your, um, your answer and your result depend on the size of this, this haircut subsidy, right? Uh, so can you say something more generalized uh, you know, for your result in terms of the causal impact of policy uncertainty? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. So I think that really what's important here is, so, you know, the literature has oftentimes looked at is it this long maturity that in itself is going to deliver you the result? So is it enough that the central bank is suddenly going to give you three year loans that is going to, you know, just revive the economy and what we argue is exactly as you're saying the size of the uncertainty which in our case we measure as the you know different uh the, the gap between the funding you can get from the market and you can get from the ecb really matters and in the paper we actually run a placebo test with a similar exercise that uh, the ecb has done in 2009 i believe which for the first time they introduced such very long uh liquidity operations but the important thing is that back then, the size of the haircut gap in the economy was really small. So even if this funding was you know, unavailable, you could as well go to private markets and you could borrow at very, very similar financing costs. And we show in this um, robustness exercise or in this placebo test that uh, you get no effect on credit and obviously you get no effect on the real economy. So it's not only about this policy introduction of long maturity, but it's really important about uh, you know, um, the size of the haircut gap, the size of the haircut subsidy that actually is, is very important to, to make the policy successful. Just a clarification on that placebo test. So um, the when the haircut gap was uh, small between yeah. the um, private market and what you could get from the ECB, could you still get uh, that long of maturity funding from the private market? So back then the maturity was only one year. That was, so the first time the, the okay. central bank has done it was a one year maturity, but it was already back then the longest I believe was one month. So it was a big deal. It was shortly after the Lehman. It, it was, you know, very much advertised in financial news that the central bank is offering a one year. It's nothing like the Fed has ever done. So at the time it, the, the one year in itself was very meaningful. The thing is that if you would think that one year is different from three years, I would argue that we should still see at least some credit impact. But we really see that there's pretty much none because the banks would be thinking like, well, if I don't get this one year, I can go to private repo market and I can pretty much get the exact same value of funding from these external sources. So there's no so much uncertainty about how am I going to fund myself if this funding dries out. While in the second case, really, as you could see in the graph that I showed, like the gap the average gap for the Portuguese uh, firm, sorry, for the Portuguese bank is approximately 60 percentage points. So you can really get almost nothing if you pledge your Portuguese government bond or your Portuguese bank bond to the private market. You, your only chance to get funding with this type of security is to rely on the central bank. So if the central bank pulls the plug and they stop providing this unlimited liquidity, well, you as a bank have no easy way to finance yourself going forward. Okay. Do you, um, just a quick follow-up, do you see any shift in the types of lending the, the bank, banks do, like uh, going from more term loans or more credit lines to term loans, like more stable financing? Excellent. So we do both uh, credit lines and actual loans. So you do see uh, there's, a, there, uh, there's an effect on both. The, the primary thing you really see is that you see the banks are moving towards longer maturity loans. So they are more likely okay. to offer less liquid loans. And again, this is something that we believe is consistent with the, with the real option channel. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Thank you. 
maybe uh, just a simple question. So how much do you think is the, the effect of policy per se, that a policy was conducted, that uncertainty about policy? Um, that's a great question. We have actually uh, struggled with this like a lot when we were going through it. And so our sense when, especially reading the reading the announcements or, you know, the, the earnings uh, calls and, and the annual announcements of the banks is that especially running up for uh, to the policy announcement, the, the bankers were talking a lot about, we are unsure how we're going to fund ourselves going forward, the, you know, all the local bonds have been downgraded, we are exploring new options of financing. And approximately one month before our policy happened, some of the central bankers from the ECB go on these public speeches, and they say things like, for now, we see our unlimited policy being available for approximately half a year, and then we will reevaluate. And you really see the markets basically thinking about this unlimited funding being available for say half a year with certainty and after that you need to wait and see what's going to happen. And this is also the time when the ECB is changing the president. So Mario Draghi just became the president of the ECB. So you can also argue there's a lot of uncertainty about like what type of uh, monetary policy the ECB will be conducting once they change the president of the central bank. So clearly when you like go up to the to the actual policy change, there's a lot of uncertainty both observed on the banking sector, but also coming from the central bank. They, they, they don't know exactly which direction they're going to go. So would it be possibly uh, to use like uh, Steve and his team has to, to create kind of a text uh, text indicator of this uncertainty and to combine I think so. to really see that uncertainty fell at the time that policy was conducted? I, I think so. We actually have an entire online appendix full of those speeches. So I think that that's, that's definitely something that, that, that could be done going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank are, you. are there any questions? Well, I, I just have a small question that follows up on yours. Uh, I don't, and this is just a question kind of out of my ignorance. I don't know how many of these banks are publicly listed. And if so, whether it's possible to use financial market indicators to assess either realized volatility or better yet, implied volatility measures if they if they are available, is that is that a feasible? So that that would be complementary to the textbook yeah. approach. True. So not many. Uh, so you know, European banks are usually very large. So we, in our sample, we have around forty banks, and I believe the largest six are listed. So we can definitely get the information for the largest six. And again, like I talked about the cross-sectional variation, there's a massive variation even in the top six. I think one of the top six is actually with a very high haircut subsidy, the other is on the other side. So it's funding itself with like much different type of securities. So we can definitely look at the financial markets on these banks, I agree. Yeah. And again, this is a question that comes about out of my ignorance. It's. I'm struck, and you noticed as well, the connection between your paper and one of the results in our analysis. Did did equity markets move in a big way in yes. reaction to these? Okay, so these 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 two policy uh, shifts you talked about are going to be in our sample. They should and be. Yeah. So we we, so, we got to go. We should go back and look and study those episodes, and we, and they may show up in our sample several times because we have so more. European country. Okay. They, they happened twice. So they had so the, the, the policy happened twice. So it was announced early December and the first allotment came in December. So December 2011 is the first time. And then the bigger liquidity came uh, last day of February 2012. So February 2012 and December 2001 should be especially the times. And based on my reading of the literature, this was specifically selling in, in the southern part of Europe. So Italy, Spain, Portugal, even France. Was was quite uh, impacted mm -hmm. by this policy. Mm. Okay. Well, we'll we'll follow up, try to study okay. these, these events. They 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 do seem quite quite relevant to uh, for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happy to talk more about that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe one last question. If there is uh, uh, if there is a last question. Okay, and if not, we, we thank you very much, Martina. And uh, we can go on with the second paper, uh, taking stock of trade policy uncertainty evidence from China 
and uh, I, I don't know who, who presenting, George or Shafat or Armen. George, I see George. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you. Can you um, see my yes. screen okay? Yes. Great. yes um, we see I'm trying to make sure I can see a few faces too. So um, let me um, thank the organizers for including this paper on the program. This is a uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, this is joint work with Shafat and Armin, who are um, recently graduated uh, students from Rochester. Shafat's at the World Bank, and Armin is uh, going to do a postdoc um, in Connecticut. Um, and they're both, they've go both got a, a wonderful portfolio of papers uh, trying to explore the interaction between trade policy and trade. Uh, definitely very interesting work. So, so, um, so Steve kind of touched on this a little bit um, when he said that trade policy uh, since Trump has been um, you know, a big mover of markets and it's been quite uncertain. Um, and I, I think more generally, um, you know, if we go back since the Great Recession, there's been a lot of uncertainty about trade policy, both on the upside and the downside in the sense that there was talk about, um, you know, these big trade agreements, TTIP and TPP. Um, and then there's all these trade disagreements with Brexit and, and uh, the Chinese uh, US trade war. And so, um, you know, a lot of firms have been operating with a lot of uncertainty. Um, they've had to form some expectations and sort of move on with life. And so what we wanna to try to do with this paper is try to understand how firms um, operate in an uncertain environment. So, um, so let, me, let me try to be a little bit clearer about what precisely we're trying to do and just sort of boil it down into two very interrelated questions. Um, the first question we're interested in is how do agents respond in anticipation of future uncertain changes in tariffs? Okay, so, um, you know, that's, that's a straightforward thing that we'd, we'd like to understand. Um, you know, um, the second question is how do we measure those future uncertain uh, paths of tariffs, right? Um, most trade agreements actually have uh, well-defined phase outs of tariffs. Um, actually, uh, the new USMCA agreement has like uh, sort of phase ins of, of uh, domestic content rules, but you know, deals like Brexit don't really have anything like that. There was a ton of uncertainty about when, um, you know, in, in multiple dimensions. So, let me try to be a little bit clearer when we talk about future uncertain path of tariffs. You can kind of think about tariffs changing in terms of when they're going to change. So with Brexit, um, you know, there was all kinds of uncertainty as to when exactly we were going to have Brexit. Um, there's a question of how much our tariffs going to change. Um, and then there's a question of how likely. And so these are kind of three things that you have to sort out um, to then understand how firms are going to behave. And so that's what we're going to try to do today. Um, you know, obviously with Brexit, the U.S.-China trade war, these are really complicated things to figure out. We're going to kind of uh, make our lives easy by just going back and, and uh, revisiting kind of these two interrelated questions by looking at U.S.-China trade in the 90s. Um, um, what, one of the things that's kind of nice about U.S.-China trade in the 1990s is that there was a policy where kind of the tariffs had to be renewed every year in some way. And so what our, our innovation in this paper is going to be is we're going to, we're going to use within year variation in kind of future tariff risk from the political process. And the idea is almost trivial. I'm kind of embarrassed about it. It's so simple is, is that, you know, leading up to like the, the renewal decision, firms are going to be facing some risk in the next couple of months that the tariffs are going to go up. But once the, once the, the these tariffs are renewed, that risk is going to drop a lot. And so they, they feel like, hey, we're pretty good for the next 12 months and we can kind of go back to business as usual. But the thing we have to figure out is how, how um, are the decisions that they're making leading up to the risk going to then impact the way they behave after the risk is substantially reduced, okay? Um, so let me give you a preview of what we're going to find. Um, the first thing we're going to find is that imports kind of trade from China to the United States. Um, are going to be rising quite strongly in the monthly data um, uh, leading up to these renewal votes. Um, now, anyone who sort of lived through, um, you know, last year and, uh, um, you know, the COVID stockpiling we did in, at our own houses understands this mechanism clearly, right? The future looks uncertain. It looks pretty bad. You better go ahead and get as much of this stuff ahead of time. And so that's what we're going to basically um, see in the data pretty strongly. We're gonna then um, use kind of the behavior that we're seeing in the data um, to then uh, estimate basically um, an SS model, inventory model, that's gonna tell us that the non-renewal probability was actually pretty low, even though we find substantial stockpiling, about 5% for a year. 
What we're then going to, in the paper, which I won't really talk about, is we'll sort out, you know, the roles of expected changes in tariffs versus uncertainty. So in some sense, if people have a positive probability that tariffs are going to go up in the future, there's going to be a first, first moment effect, and then there's this uncertainty effect. And so we'll be able to sort out that, you know, all of this anticipatory stockpiling was related to the first moment effect. And then it'll be somehow uh, mitigated a little bit by the, the kind of wait and, the usual wait and see uncertainty effects. Okay. Um, and then, you know, another part that's in this paper, which I'm not going to really talk about today, is we'll show that the losses from stockpiling, because you're kind of inefficiently moving, well, you're efficiently moving around your, your uh, inventories, is going to actually contribute to, like, lower trade in these products that have these high tariff risks, um, something that's been talked about um, in the literature quite a bit. So let me just sort, uh, let me sort of kind of uh, frame the problem through, like, a very simple model um, and analysis. So, um, again, as I said, you know, every one of us did this um, last uh, April when we were kind of worried about COVID in, in the sense that we ran out and stockpiled. Um, I'm going to sort of think about this in terms of let's think about an industry that has like a 10% uh, is facing a possible 10% tariff hike. And, you know, what are you going to do in anticipation of that if you know that's going to happen at a certain point? I'm going to sort of show you what you would do in, in, through the lens of an SS inventory model, right? Those are models where, um, we're going to be thinking about a firm that, that is buying some inputs from China, um, bringing them to the United States, kind of differentiating them, and then selling them to consumers. And we're going to think about that firm kind of knows that at a certain point, tariffs could go up, but then when we get to that point, tariffs actually don't change. So facing that risk, what are the firm, what are firms going to do? They're going to kind of change the timing of their ordering, right? Um, they're going to sort of shift a little bit of their orders to just before the tariffs rise, um, kind of when they think tariffs are going to be relatively low, and the strength of that shifting is going to basically be related to the, the size of the pr projected tariff increase. So, um, okay. Importantly, in, through the lens of an SS inventory model, these kind of movements of stock, anticipatory stockpiling and destocking are only going to be kind of affected um, in a narrow window around like the, the, the tariff risk. Okay. So no one in December started stockpiling, um, you know, for COVID. They started stockpiling in March. All right, so here's, you know, just a, 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 an example. Um, so we kind of think about this is kind of the timeline. We're looking months, and then there's, you know, some date where we're going to get a realization of tariffs could go up by 10%. So, you know, we can kind of think of an industry with lots of firms who are kind of getting hit with idiosyncratic shocks. And if there's no risk, kind of the level of trade is going to be kind of constant over time. Once we add this risk, and let's say there's a 20% chance that this tariff is going to go up in this period, what are people going to do? Well, it's not going to affect behavior in the very beginning, but as we get to get close to this shock window, people are going to start buying more of it. And then having bought more and having full warehouses, when the shock comes and it's good news, they're still going to cut back on their trade, right? Um, it's, if it's a bigger probability that tariffs are going to go up, you know, people are going to do more stockpiling and it's going to start feeding into earlier periods and they're going to do more destocking later on, okay? And this is going to keep keep going. Okay, so the idea is going to really be thinking about you know put this this model in the back of your head. We're going to be looking for something like this in the data, um, and that that's the plan of this paper. All right. So let me talk a little bit about like the U.S. China trade relations over time. Um, so it, it's super fascinating um, in the sense that you know there was an embargo between U.S. and China from 1949 to 71. So there's literally zero trade for 22 years. That embargo gets lifted. Um, and it starts at really high tariffs. And then in 1980, um, the tariffs go down to what we call MFN rates, okay? But those MFN rates are subject to annual renewal. Um, and that annual renewal um, has to happen by um, July of every year. Importantly, um, there, when this program was implemented, there was not a lot of uh, history of this program. This is um, actually China was only the third country to get access this way. And when we start looking at this, this uh, over time, by the 90s, more programs, have, more countries have br been brought into it, but it's actually a fairly new program in the early parts, which is not really relevant for this paper, but for some more work I'm doing. All right, from 1990 onwards, um, Congress sort of jumps in and says, listen, we need to be involved in the renewal process. And they start voting on it um, within 60 days of, of this July 3rd date. Um, ex post MFN rates, these kind of low tariff rates, um, were uh, always uh, achieved by, by China. Um, and then um, in, it, towards the end of uh, October of 2000, Congress basically 
you know, codifies these uh, low MFN rates um, when China joins the WTO, which happens in December of the following year. Okay. Um, so great. For our purposes here, this basically is, is going to be really useful for us to kind of thinking about um, kind of the, the questions about trade policy uncertainty that I sort of laid out, which were which are hard questions for Brexit, but in this situation, they're sort of easy. So remember, I said that there's three questions, you know, when is it going to happen? Well, every year after presidential renewal and Congress votes, how much is, are the tariffs going to change? Well, we have, if, the, if there's no renewal, we're going to go to these high NNTR rates, non-normal trade relations. Um, and those NNTR rates are basically time invariant, and they were set way before, uh, uh, um, you know, a long time ago in 1930s. The only question that we don't, we can't answer for the China case is how likely is this to happen, right? And so what we're going to try to do is we're going to, we're going to use kind of the anticipatory dynamics that we see leading up to uh, kind of the, these, these uh, renewal decisions in the United States to sort of back out how people were projecting the likelihood of this happening. Okay. All right. So that's kind of, um, you know, what makes the China situation an easier situation for us to study. And so what we'll do is just empirically look um, for uh, some kind of unusual behavior for products that had kind of high trade policy risk. Um, and we're going to basically be exp doing a difference in difference type of estimation. And we're going to, um, you know, the, the key idea is going to be is every, every, every product is going to face like the same probability of non-renewal because that's, that's going to fit, affect each product. But each product is going to have a different kind of um, change in the tariff that they're going to face. Okay. And so what we'll do is we'll kind of look over the course of each year, does this lead to some kind of seasonal that's particularly strong for products that had relatively high tariff risk in the way that, you know, something like this picture would suggest, okay, where there's going to be kind of booms and busts in trade for products that have relatively high tariff risks. And the magnitude of the booms and busts is going to kind of change year to year are going to basically let us understand um, how the likelihood of non-renewal is changing each year, okay? So that's what we're, we're sort of after. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have, you know, rich, rich trade data. So there's going to be, you know, let's say uh, thousands and thousands of prime products that are basically exported from China to the United States um, uh, each, uh, each month. Um, so we can think about from, we're going to sort of do a big difference in difference exercise. So we'll be thinking about, you know, all the trade coming to the United States from country I, um, we'll actually even look beyond the United States. So we think about trade flows from country I to period J to country J in, uh, of good Z in period T. We're going to be looking at growth rates. And the main reason to look at growth rates is because we're looking at really disaggregated data, there's tons of lumpiness. And so we're going to kind of try to smooth that out by looking at kind of uh, the growth rate of three, basically like we'll be looking at like the six month growth rate of three month kind of moving averages of trade flows. Okay. Um, the nice thing about doing it this way is we're going to be able to cancel out kind of year fixed effects. The tariff risk for every product coming to the United States is basically the gap between kind of the tariff you would, you would face if There's some products where tariffs would go up by 100%, and then there's a distribution of tariff gaps. And so the idea is firms are going to face a common probability, but um, kind of the change in risk that they're face the risk that they're facing is different across all these products. Okay, so what we would expect is that products that face a bigger risk, there's more incentives to stockpile than products that face no risk. Okay, and that that risk is going to be bigger um, in the early period than after China joins uh, the WTO. All right, so as I said, you know, there's, you know, all kinds of identification challenges. One is this lumpiness that I mentioned. Um, that's why we're going to be aggregating into sort of these 
these windows. Um, the other is there could be sector specific seasonality. So we'll have like lots of rich fixed effects. Um, and then there's could be, you know, country specific seasonality. So there's two, two sources of, you know, country specific seasonality. So you could think these are driven by supply factors. So you kind of think, you know, hey, maybe for whatever reason, China, maybe the Chinese New Year or some other Chinese thing uh, is going to sort of lead China to sort of produce more in certain types of the year, certain types of the year, certain times of the year. The way we'll control for that is we'll, we'll basically be looking at, you know, products coming from China, but going to, say, Europe or the United States. Okay. We'll also think about U.S. seasonalities, right? So you can kind of think about maybe the U.S. really likes, um, you know, these high, high, high risk goods um, in, in, in July every year. And so we'll control for that by looking at, you know, U.S. imports of the same products coming from China and the rest of the world. Well, the rest of the world is going to be, you know, a group of countries that, um, you know, have these MFN rates and no risk. Um, so great. So what, what, what does this sort of turn into in terms of the difference in different type of specification? Well, you know, what we're basically looking for is, you know, we're going to basically estimate every month of the year so a coefficient on trade flows. And we're going to sort of ask, you know, are, is that coefficient on trade flows kind of different in the pre-period versus the post-period for U.S.-China trade? Okay. And this coefficient is multiplied by this tariff risk. And as I said, we've got, you know, a rich set of fixed effects. Um, and, you know, the, the theory is basically telling us, if you remember that picture I showed you, we should see a lot, a lot of kind of imports coming in just before the risk is resolved. And then we should see trade falling off sharply after the risk is resolved. Okay. All right. So again, um, um, we're basically looking for a seasonal that's kind of on, that's kind of China U.S. specific in products that face a high tariff risk. So that's exactly what we found. These are kind of the, 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 uh, the seasonal we're finding. It's basically saying that, you know, in the months leading up to the, the tariff resolution, trade is really high, and then it falls off sharply over the course of the rest of the year. Okay. Um, this kind of tariff risk um, is, uh, uh, let me sort of put some perspective in uh, about the size of this tariff risk. Okay. So if we think about the median uncertain tariff increase, that's going to be about a 31% um, tariff increase. That's that distribution of tariff changes. Before uncertainty, what we're basically seeing is that imports rise about 8%. So you can think about an anticipatory elasticity of 0.27. And then after the resolution, imports are going to fall about 11%. So a resolution elasticity of 0.36. All right. Now, this is for an uncertain tariff increase in Shafat and Armin's previous work. They actually looked at, um, you know, what happens in anticipation of certain tariff cuts by looking at NAFTA. The thing about NAFTA is, you know, that tariffs are going to kind of drop in January of every year. And so what they basically can look at is, you know, what are the tariff elastic anticipatory tariff elasticities when you know tariffs are going to drop? And then once you've kind of cut trade in advance, how much does trade, you know, rise when tariffs actually fall? And so they find, you know, elasticities that are, you know, the tariff cuts in, in NAFTA are much smaller, about 3%. And they find that imports fall about 18% and then rise about 22%. So you can kind of look at these, these coefficients on these tariff elasticities as 6 and minus 7.5. So, you know, if you want to do a back of the envelope calculation of comparing, of understanding like how much risk there was, if we just compare like these, these tariff elasticities, 0.27, from an uncertain change in tariff to a certain change in tariff of six, we get about four and a half percent. That's going to be a strikingly good, um, you know, reduced form way of kind of calculating what we're going to get out of the model when we go and estimate the model. Okay, so um, we do a ton of robustness and and, and it's it's very robust. Uh, I'll show you just one, which is you know everyone says, well the mechanism you're talking about is going to be much more important for things that are storable than are not storable, right? So uh, bricks who don't depreciate. Um, it's less costly to sort of place a big order and kind of hold them in the warehouse. Um, flowers, which depreciate, really fresh flowers, you know, you wouldn't do this, right? Um, and so we can sort the products in, in that same way. And what we've looked at is the, the kind of high storability goods and the, and the kind of low storability goods. We can kind of see this, this effect that we're talking about, this kind of extra seasonal is much stronger for high storability than low storability goods. Okay, great. Okay, so let me um, let me kind of come back to the model. So so with those facts, which are kind of new facts, which I, I think no one has, had ever really talked about, but they should be completely intuitive. And it's 
it's sort of surprisingly how well, well it works out. Um, um, we, what we want to do is kind of now build a model. We can kind of see if we can kind of fit the model to, to basically this figure right here. And by fitting the model to this figure, we're going to then basically back out what the probability that, that people were kind of uh, had in their minds and were behaving with. Okay. Okay. So I already, I already described the model. The, the model is a model, um, I mean, I, I'm sort of embarrassed to sort of say it builds on my own work because this is just a standard SS inventory model applied to the uh, open economy. Um, and, and so it goes back, you know, really, it's a really old model. So we'll think about a continuum of monopolist Im importers who, as I said, differentiate and resell foreign intermediates. They start out each period with some, some stock S of those, those inputs. Um, uh, we could ob obviously re reinterpret this decision as, you know, there's Chinese exporters who are kind of uh, making export decisions and they're kind of then selling their stuff once it's been in the U.S. The important thing is you have to kind of cross the border before the tariffs go up. Um, there'll be a fixed import cost, there'll be demand uncertainty, and a one-month delivery lag to sort of kind of capture the fact that, you know, when it takes a while to kind of get stuff from, uh, from China to the United States. The cost of, of holding these goods is going to be related to, you know, interest costs and depreciation. We're going to think about that depreciation being something that's going to vary across products. As I talked about, you know, bricks are storable, flowers are not storable. And then we'll think about, um, we're going to normalize the price of these goods, but then we'll think about there'll be like a tariff tau, which is greater than one that's going to be possibly stochastic. Okay. And then in the background, these, these importers are going to be reselling their products sub, subject to a standard CS demand curve that has some kind of IID demand shifter and some demand elasticity. So it's going to look pretty much like a standard um, you know, trade model, but we'll just be thinking about it, an inventory model um, with these kind of fixed adjustment costs. Okay. So you know, I'm not going to kind of go George, through- there the are five minutes. Yep, that's uh, perfect. I'm not going to go through the Bellman equations, but you know, these are kind of models that we are very comfortable with working with. They're just going to be discrete choice models. Um, and you know they're going to lead to like uh, a reorder point and then a, a reorder level. Okay. What we're going to kind of add to the conventional kind of stationary model is some tariff risk where it can basically be, this tariff can kind of go up and the, prob the transition matrix is going to be time varying basically to capture the idea that every July tariffs could kind of go up. And if they don't go up in July, they're going to come back down. All right. So, you know, this is kind of the, the you know, at the beginning of the year or 12, you know, we can think about like August after this has been renewed, firms are sitting there saying, well, tariffs are going to be constant for the next 12 months. And then next July, we're going to face this risk where tariffs could go up or they could stay the same. Okay. And then the problem is going to repeat every year. So what does this model basically give us? As I said, it's going to give you, you know, what I've written down is the decision rules of the firms where this is kind of like your state, your endogenous state variable, which is how much inventory you have at home. And this is the idiosyncratic demand shock. High demand is good, low demand is bad. So there's a reorder point where, you know, when you place an order, you want to come back into the, into the, with like a certain amount of inventory. And then there's a re lower threshold says that whatever demand is pretty high and you have low inventories or demand is low and you have even lower inventories, you place an order. Okay, so these are the decision rules uh, in a stationary equilibrium. And then facing tariff risk, these decision rules say a year ahead of time don't change. They, don't, they basically don't change until you kind of get within the reorder window. And that's what I wanted to basically show you is that as you kind of get close to the reorder window, people become a little bit more cautious. People don't run out when they first hear about COVID and stockpile in December. But then when you get to like, you know, March, everyone runs out and stockpiles. Okay. So that, that basically shows that everyone kind of shifts to the right, starts placing big orders, um, and everyone places an order. What that does is it basically generates a boom and a bust in trade flows and the boom and the bust are related to, you know, what's the size of the change in trade in, in tariffs. So this is nothing happens if tariffs aren't going to change. If they go up a lot, big boom, big bust, um, by smaller amounts, smaller booms and smaller busts. Okay. And of course, what's happening is you're, you know, stock, this is the inventory sales ratio guys are stockpiling and destocking and the amount of stockpiling destocking is related to kind of what the tariff risk was. Okay. Great. Um, you know, you can also think about the storability, right? You know, why, why did people load up on toilet paper? Because it's super, super storable. Okay. All right. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take this model. We're just going to basically estimate average and time varying probabilities of that non-renewal. 
but we're just going to match kind of like the product level characteristics um, in some sort of indirect inference. Um, so let me kind of just jump ahead and show you what we're going to basically get. Um, we're going to basically try to match, you know, we're going to kind of match the model to the data and we're going to try to match kind of the boom and bust in trade flows with that by varying the probability. And what that's going to give us is a kind of average probability over the whole period, about 5%. We can kind of go back and redo the exercise year by year to come with annual probabilities. And those are going to vary between two and 10%. We can then go and compare those probabilities to news-based measures of non-renewal. And this is what we sort of get. These are the blue line is kind of our measure. Basically, you can kind of see probabilities go down and they go up and they come back down towards the end as we're kind of moving to, not, to China joining the WTO. And these are the news measures that come out of a paper by Pearson Schott. You know, this is just a complementary way of kind of looking at, you know, this trade policy risk without us going and reading all the papers, but actually kind of asking the firm, survey, in some sense, we're, we're surveying the firms that are actually making decisions by looking at their actions. Okay, let me jump ahead for a second. Um, let me, you know, um, since I'm running out of time, let me just kind of talk a little bit about this mechanism at work in the rest of the world. Um, so obviously trade policy was uncertain since Brexit and the U.S. election. Um, and there was, you know, all these tariff changes. What I want to show you is that the mechanism we're talking about every year for China also was going on with Brexit. So let me just show you what I've got here is like a plot of the inventory to kind of production ratios in the UK over time. This line is, is the Brexit vote. This is kind of the first date of, you know, Brexit, leaving Brexit. This is the second date. And I kind of stopped looking at the data after COVID. Um, and what do you basically see is a huge kind of stockpiling that takes place in anticipation. If anyone was sort of reading the newspapers those days, there's all these stories of Londoners who were kind of, they wanted to sort of make sure they got their Nutella. And so their basements were full of Nutella. Um, and then when, when, uh, when it didn't happen, they started eating their Nutella and then they, they stocked up again. Uh, you know, if I'm a Londoner, I'm probably tired of Nutella now, but um, I think it also happened again when Brexit actually did happen. That then fed into, if we look at kind of trade flows, there was a kind of boom and bust in trade, a boom and bust in trade. And if we look at you know, industrial production, there's kind of a boom and bust, kind of boom and bust, okay? So you know, this is sort of just trying to say that the, the, the things that we identified in, uh, for kind of this annual renewal process also seem to have been important in understanding the dynamics of the real world in the last uh, few years. So um, let me just kind of um, stop there. You know, what we're trying to do is just uh, a quantify trade policy uncertainty that leverages kind of the near term PPU using monthly data, um, kind of a lot of the trade data um, kind of smooths out that mon monthly data. We think that's super informative. Um, obviously with this crowd that uses kind of even more high frequency data, um, this is not, you know, shouldn't be any surprise. Um, we, we have some new evidence on, on, on how much TPU there was um, and what, how firms are kind of responding to that risk with stockpiling. Um, uh, importantly, you know, one of the nice features of kind of the margin that we're looking at is it, we can kind of cordon off like short run risk from really long term risk that would be kind of in like uh, decisions related to FDI or kind of the export decision. Um, uh, you know, the, the future research would basically be to kind of, you know, revisit these annual effects. And I've, I've got some new work with Armin and Shafat and Kim Rule and Joe Steinberg kind of looking at the, the whole history of uh, Chinese trade integration, um, these aggregate effects. And then we've got some work kind of looking at the stockpiling that was due to COVID and kind of how we can extract what different countries thought was going to be the, 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 the dynamics of the disease um, at the very beginning in last February. So, so let me just sort of stop there and, and, and thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, George. So please, uh, if you have questions from the audience, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Stephen, yes, please. Uh, th thanks, George, for the interesting talk. Um, Couple of thoughts that one well, may not be fully formed. You you made this nice distinction um, on the storability dimension and and showed how your data support that. Another distinction, which I'm wondering whether you can make in the data, is I I guess I put under the heading of switching costs. So you know we often think that intermediate inputs uh, that involve global supply chains are difficult to switch quickly, whereas consumer goods and some commodities might be, you know, more fungible. And if switching costs are a big deal, then the high frequency kind of uncertainty variation that you are isolating is less relevant, I think. 
um, than for goods where you can, if it's just a question of stockpiling your gasoline now and getting it a higher price later, that's very different than if you have to redo your factory assembly line because you can no longer get critical parts from China. So I guess the question is whether you can make that distinction in the data and when you take out products for which you think they are, the switching costs would be high, do you get even stronger results for what's left? That's kind of the first question comment. And second, I guess um, there's low frequency variation. And you sort of, you, you indicated this at the end, there's low frequency variation uncertainty that this exercise won't pick up. So again, in the, in the context where switching costs are high, uh, presumably some firms are in the pre-WTO accession period are just staying away from Chinese imports in general because they know that sometime in the next one, two, five, 10 years, there's a risk that there might be a supply cutoff. That would, that would um, impede trade with China in a way that isn't gonna be captured in your analysis. Um, so, so yeah, Steve, th um, th th thanks so much uh, for the comments. Um, so uh, you and I had like a discussion many, many years ago when you were an editor on a paper that was kind of related to these switching costs, um, which you probably don't remember, but it stuck with me. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things we, we do look at is, you know, are there products that are kind of high elasticity products or low elasticity products? And, you know, do we get the same sort of results? Everything sort of goes through, um, you know, I, I think, you know, what, what you have in mind is there's, you know, if, if, if the tariffs go up and we can kind of very quickly just find a new supplier, then why would we ever stockpile, right? Um, and so I, I think um, what we're sort of seeing today is that that's not really the case um, with some of the supply disruptions we're having. We've sort of sorted the goods using these elasticity measures and we get sort of very, you know, stronger results. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's um, very supportive. Um, I, to your second point, which is about kind of these low frequency movements. Um, so so let, me, um, let me sort of say like, I, I think one of the beauties, one of the beautiful things about this is that these, we're able to sort of, I, separate the low frequency from the high frequency. And I, I really like that. Um, the, the, the mechanism for kind of the inventory mechanism is, it sort of works in a very different way than like an export investment mechanism, which is what you're, you're really sort of thinking about. Um, and if you guys can like humor me for a second, like, or let me, let me just sort of say like, um, um, you know, the inventory mechanism is gonna sort of, uh, you know, if you have to kind of do this stocking and destocking, that's gonna discourage you from sort of doing it, but it's, it's a small impact on kind of the, the cost of doing business. It'll kind of lower the value of the firm by two or 3%. The kind of long run risk, which is, hey, you know, if this goes back up, like, you know, I'm an exporter for six years on average, I lose like most of that investment. That's a kind of much bigger, bigger risk. Um, and, you know, I, I was kind of alluding to that other paper that I just talked about. We're kind of doing work to sort of quantify that mechanism. Um, that's the kind of mechanism that people sort of ha have had in mind in the literature. Um, you know, the, the key challenge with that is like, is kind of sorting out the future risk from the past changes in policy. And that's kind of the part that when I was talking about the long run history of, of Chinese, like, uh, um, you know, trade policy, let me actually throw, throw this picture up. Just, I'm um, sorry, because I, I had it at the very end. And uh, this is like a, a fairly new paper. Um, Did we lose George? Yeah, I think so. I think he's gone. It's such a fabulous picture. It just <laughs> fried, the, fried the connection. It's so Zoom. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I just, since, no, since we're waiting for George, it is kind of, is. His paper, as I read this paper, it is kind of different than the other papers. I think of the like the Hanley Limao line of research, it's really more on these low frequency shifts, and this is isolating the high frequency variation in in uh, tariff risk in in the near term. It, it is kind of neat to think about it that way. Mm. So, so, so okay, my I think, yeah, go ahead. I think, no, I'm seeing. Uh, George was out, out of the, so maybe he's, he's back. Oh, he's Sorry back. about that. <laughs> um, I was talking to myself. It took me a while to figure out what, 
what happened. Um, we dissected your paper while you were away. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's better. <laughs> I don't know about what happened, but I'll go look at the, the recording. Uh, basically, what I was going to basically show you was, um, you know, we've looked in this other paper, we've looked at precisely at these kind of low frequency movements, and we've, we've recovered like an our estimate of the risk using kind of that margin. And, you know, we're able to sort of basically say like the, the risk was really high in the 1980s. And by the time we got to the 1990s, it was really low. But I think this is, you know, part of a research agenda of connect using the models and the data to sort of connect like a people's paths of, of trade policy risk. So, sorry about that. I clicked on the wrong. I must have clicked on the wrong thing. So, so George, just one very quick point. On, so, I, I, I think you made us believe that this is a paper different from handling the mouse AR paper, which is good. Uh, on top of that, I'm wondering whether you can. Kind of have a more general setting which you can use this uh jump in the uh ordering just before and after the policy shock to identify both the first moment and the second moment of a, a future event that would, that would go beyond trade because i mean this is about subjective uncertainty which people are interested in so uh if you can kind of have a general uh serum or something like that or, that can tell us to use which moments to identify uh, which parameter. Uh, so for me, I mean, I, 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 I can, I can come up with something top of my, my head, but I guess both the level and 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 the drop are going to be to be important for that kind of uh, approach. I, I, I think it definitely goes beyond trade. This is a, a general question people people want to know about this subject yeah. to uncertainty. Yeah, so um, in, in this situation with, um, I mean, I, I think for the general point in like Brexit kind of things, it's, it's uh, you know, you have to write down a bigger model with a different sort of shock process. And um, in this China situation, it's kind of nice because, you know, the, the you know, we, the, the change in tariffs is fixed always, right? right. And so we don't have to kind of deal with that. Um, and so this, the, the kind of uncertainty um, and kind of first moment and second moments are kind of very tightly connected. One of the things we do in the paper is, you know, uncertainty only really matters um, um, or uncertainty matters a lot when there's like a, a high probability of, of uh, tariffs changing or like a really big tariff shock. So one of the things we can sort of look at is, you know, these wait and see effects become bigger and bigger um, with higher tariffs and higher, uh, um, higher probabilities. Um, so we can kind of use the, you know, in some sense, we, we can kind of use kind of the, the nonlinearities and kind of the responses to sort out like uncertainty from um, the first moment effects. We, ha we haven't been able to sort of do it, um, you know, uh, in this paper, because in part, like the data is just so lumpy, it's really hard to work with. Um, and sort of it, it's demanding a lot um, from this data. But I think if we had like, you know, uh, transaction level data that um, allowed us to sort of leverage that a little bit more, we could sort of do more. But it's, it's definitely something we want to try to do. And, and uh, you know, I, I mentioned that we're working on this kind of the likelihood of COVID spreading. Um, that's kind of one of the things we're, we're, we're kind of dealing with um, with the trade data. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. I think we have to move to, to the, the next paper uh, on country thanks, risk. And uh, Tarek is supposed to present. Tarek is here. Thank you very much. We see the presentation. Uh, but uh, maybe you're muted. I don't hear you. Sorry. OK, here we go. So joint work with Jesse, Marcus, and Ahmed. Um, all right. So uh, researchers and policymakers often argue that global perceptions of risk are a major driver of international capital flows, financial contagion, and sudden stops, all kind of big topics in the international finance literature. Um, it's proven often difficult to measure global risk perceptions. So what we do in this paper is we introduce a novel measure of the commercial risk global executives and investors associate with a given country. Uh, then we're going to characterize crises and global transmission of risk using those measures and study the association between country risk, capital flows, asset prices, exchange rates, and firm level outcomes. 
All right. So uh, our data set uh, is one that we've used in previous papers, uh, which are the earnings conference calls. Uh, we have a complete set of 300,000 of them. Um, there, there are 11,865 unique firms that are headquartered in 82 countries, uh, 2002 to 2020. Uh, for those of you who don't know these earnings calls, there's typically four calls per year uh, after the firm releases its earnings and then the management team and interested analysts and financial investors jump on the phone and talk about uh, basically the report. Um, now, so the, the, the research question here is what share of the conversation between management and participants centers on risks associated with a given foreign country? So the way we're going to do this is using training libraries. Um, so uh, we're going to use actually the same data source that Nick is going to talk about uh, tomorrow, which is, uh, so we have uh, the um, Economist Intelligence Unit uh, country reports going back to 2002. We're downloading these for 45 countries. And these reports, I think Nick is probably going to talk about that more tomorrow, basically talk about what's going on in the country. Um, uh, in addition, we're going to have country regions and city names from other sources here. I'm going to put all of that material in a separate training library for each country. Um, now, the key uh, ingredient here in distinguishing speech associated with a given country is going to be this omega. Uh, so it's a weight that we associate with bigram B to country C. And the way that we do this is standard TF IDF. So we're going to have a term frequency in each training library. So for example, if I want to know what is basically the weight that I should give uh, the Angela Merkel bigram in talking about Germany, I'm going to look at how often do they say Angela Merkel in the uh, training library for Germany. And then, uh, so, that, so this is just the, the frequency divided by the total number of biograms in the library of country C interacted with what's called the inverse document frequency. And that's uh, the number of th categories that we're trying to distinguish here, 45 countries, divided by the number of training libraries in which Angela Merkel, uh, the bigram B Angela Merkel occurs. Yeah, so this is pretty standard. And you know, if you wanna put fancier sort of machine learning uh, kind of stuff in, this is where it would slot in. Yeah, so uh, um, this omega BC. All right, now, so once we have this omega BC for each two word combination in each country, we can then apply that to measure risk that firm I associates with country C at time T. How do we do that? We're gonna go through the conference call transcript of firm I at time T, and we're gonna look for these omega, any omegas for country C. So I'm going to look for Angela Merkel. And when they say Angela Merkel, I'm going to look 10 words before and after and see, do they also say something about risk or uncertainty? So we're going to have a dummy here that's one within 10 words of a synonym for risk or uncertainty. So that way I then have the risk that firm I associates with country C at time T. So that's going to be the base for everything I'm going to be doing today. Now, in addition to this measure of risk, we're also going to generate some controls. The first is very simple, which is uh, the exposure of country I, uh, sorry, a firm I to country C at time T is simply, I'm going to go and sum up all the omegas for country C in that uh, transcript. So I'm going to look how much are they talking about Germany in general. And then similarly, we might be worried that news about risk as, arrives at the same time as like maybe negative news about a given country. So we're going to have also the sentiment that firm I associates with country C at time T, which is the same construction that we use for, uh, for the risk, except that now within 10 words before and after, we're going to look for happy and sad words. So instead of looking conditioning on proximity to a synonym for risk or uncertainty, I'm going to condition on proximity to happy and sad words. And the reason why this here is a sum as opposed to a dummy is because happy and sad words are much more frequent than just synonyms for risk or uncertainty. Okay, so now these are the micro measures that all the macro measures are gonna build on. 
actually, yeah. So let me pause here and see if there's any questions, any clarifying questions at this stage. Okay. So now the next step is going to be to aggregate this up to the country level. So I'm going to define the country risk of country C at time T is going to be just the average of the risks that each of the firms in our sample associate with that country C. Um, now, what's kind of nice about this method is I can look at risk as perceived by different groups of firms. So in the standard specification, we're just going to use all firms that are headquartered in countries other than country C. So I'm going to focus on foreigners' perceptions of the riskiness of country C. But you could also do financial firms headquartered in countries other than C, or you could do all US firms or only US financial firms. You can cut this in many different ways and actually it turns out to be quite informative to do that in, uh, in some places here. Okay, so that's our measure. And we're gonna similarly aggregate country sentiment to use as a control in, in almost all of our specifications. Okay, another control I'm gonna be using a little bit later is what we call firm risk. So that's risk of firm I at time T, which is simply just counting how often do they say risk or uncertainty in the conference call transcript for firm I at time T. And this is just kind of, a, you know, the way I think about or the way we think about this is what we're really doing is we're decomposing where is your risk coming from. So we have a measure of overall risk at the firm level and then we decompose which country it's coming from. Okay. So there's a lot of validation in the paper that I won't have time to go through here in detail. So you can look at the biograms with the highest weight uh, for each country and they make intuitive sense. Uh, you can also show that, uh, you know, looking at the exposure of firm I to country C correctly identifies firms with observable business links to country C. So as far as we can see that in the data, either from Orbis data on subsidiaries or segment data, you see that the more business links there are with a given country, the more uh, exposed that firm is according to our measure. Uh, one thing I wanna show you in a little bit more detail. So this here is a, an example for the country risk of Greece. And you see sort of two things here. So the first is like the global financial crisis. You're gonna see that bump in most countries measure. And then you see COVID over here, again, a common bump for most of them. All the rest of this stuff is very Greece specific. And in particular, it's the different phases of the Greek sovereign debt crisis. Uh, in black here is the sum across all firms in our sample. And in yellow is just the financial firms. And you can see here in this, and I don't have time to show you a comparison other episodes, but you can see here just optically that a lot of the rises that are going on here are driven by financial firms. And this is because this is you know, fundamentally a crisis that affects financial firms more than non-financial firms uh, or, or disproportionately affects financial firms. What's also kind of nice about this is we often want to label these kinds of graphs with spikes. So this start of sovereign debt crisis and the possibility of Grexit, for example. Using this method, you can kind of do that pretty automatically. So uh, you know, you, we, can sort, we can go to this spike and sort which firms were driving the spike and then go to the part of the text that's driving the spike. And then what you get is something like this. The European sovereign debt crisis and the likelihood of a Greek default is critical in that a concerted F, okay. Sovereign debt crisis producing gut-wrenching market gyrations, the threat of a Greek, Spain and Italy default. So you see here, they're worrying about Greek default so we can label it Greek default risk. If you go to the last spike, concern related to the possible impact of a Greek Eurozone exit. Yeah, so that last spike was concerns about Grexit. And uh, so you don't really have to guess what these spikes are, you can label them directly from the text. Okay, so number four uh, is you can show, and let me just show you this very briefly, I'm looking at stock returns of the index in country C at time T and regressing that on changes in country risk and changes in country sentiment. And these things have the predicted signs. So when you get risk, your, uh, your stock market tends to depreciate. And when you get bad news uh, about your country, then your stock market also tends to depreciate. The same is true here for realized volatility. When we have higher risk, volatility goes up. Okay, 
So uh, let me kind of show you a few pictures. So this here is a picture of global risk, which you can define either by just taking the mean of country risk or the mean of firm risk across all firms, and you get pretty much the same time pattern here. What you see is like sort of the great moderation, relatively low risk here. Then you see the global financial crisis, then a higher level risk globally uh, until the arrival of COVID, and you see that's kind of off the scale here. So that's kind of the common component of what's going on in these measures. Now you can look at them country by country and you know maybe kind of one of the most fun things to look at in the paper that I don't have a lot of time to talk about uh, here today is just looking at the individual crises that we find for individual countries here defined simply as a two standard deviation rise above the mean uh, of, your, of, of, uh, of country risk. Um, so uh, for example, for Russia, what you're gonna be picking up the, is, the, is the oil price drop in the Crimean uh, crisis. For Turkey, what you're going to pick up is uh, uh, the attempted coup against Erdogan and then uh, balance of payments problems later. The hollow circles here are uh, crises that are more associated with financial firms than non-financial firms, whereas the, the, uh, the solid uh, uh, ones are, are not disproportionately financial. For Japan, you find the Fukushima disaster. For Brexit, for the UK, you find Brexit. For Ireland, you find Brexit and Brexit again. Yeah, so when it, when the vote happens and then when the Brexit is implemented. For Hong Kong, you get like all the uh, protests against uh, the extradition to China. For Iran, you find the uh, parts of the green movement. What's kind of interesting is that we note that we have no firms in our sample that are headquartered in Iran, but it's enough that essentially we have an, a bunch of Japanese firms talking about commercial risks associated with Japan, uh, with Iran to, uh, to pick that up here. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of stuff here. Let me maybe move on. What you find in general is that the first principal component explains about like over half of the variation in country risk. So we, I think we knew that, that there's a lot of co-movement and risk across countries and that we find that here in, the, in that measure. Uh, and country risk, as you might imagine, is counter-cyclical, while country sentiment is pro-cyclical. Yeah, and these are, two are negatively correlated. So as you might have expected, bad news tends to arrive at the same time as you have rises in risk. There's a very strong gravity structure in this country risk. And I'll talk more about the origins of this when I define transmission risk a little bit later. So we're going to have a direct measure of contagion here. Um, Simon, how, how long do you want me to speak, by the way? You are muted. Sorry, until 25. Uh, so you will have uh, about nine minutes. Uh, nine minutes. Okay. So now let's look at some. Uh, so I'm first going to look at like aggregate outcomes. So the first regression here, this is kind of something that people who like international finance are going to appreciate and everybody else is going to be like, duh. Okay. So, so the dependent variable here is cap portfolio inflows into cap into country C at time T. And on the right-hand side, I'm gonna have country risk and other variables. There is a very, very large literature in international finance that emphasizes that global vari variables explain capital flows to most countries, whereas local variables don't. Now, once I throw, so and this is kind of, you know, you can sort of see this here, global risk, when global risk is high, capital inflows everywhere are low. Now, what's interesting is once you control for country risk, this result actually changes. And we get a lot of action on this country risk. What this here says is that a one standard deviation increase in country risk is associated with an over 50% decrease in capital inflows relative to the mean. Yeah, so there's a strong uh, sort of country specific uh, piece of information that is correlated with capital flows and that's our country risk variable. And this is sort of a nice thing to, to see what this literature is all about is that when you, when you throw in real GDP growth, you get nothing, yeah? So, so that's sort of like several papers kind of complaining about this insignificant of this coefficient. Um, anyway, so, so country risk and sentiment are strongly correlated with capital inflows. So maybe this was just an issue about measurement uh, as opposed to any, anything else. So 
Now, what, whose perceptions matter for capital flows? Now, I want to be a little careful here. Like, I won't be able to, like, you know, really nail that question. But here's some anecdotal evidence. So um, I can go. So this is my main specification, all the same controls as before. Um, I can go and use only information from US firms and get pretty much the same result. Or I can go and use only information from firms that are not headquartered in the country that I'm talking about and get pretty much the same result. Yeah, so now let me try and distinguish that from the perceptions of local firms. And when, once I throw in sort of the average of firm risk in the given country, you see here that really what dominates is this variable that measures foreigners' perceptions about the riskiness of your country. Yeah? So this gels a little bit with the narrative that you often hear when you go to IMF conferences about emerging markets being really annoyed that like essentially, you know, you know, foreigners opinions of their economy matter a lot. Uh, and this is kind of some evidence that consistent with that. So now let me go to the firm level uh, analysis. Remember, we have 11,000 US and international firms, I'm going to take firm level investment and employment and regress it on firm fixed effect time fixed effect and our measures of country risk and firm risk. Yeah, so what we want to know is once your firm's risk is controlled for, does your country's riskiness and particularly like the foreigners' perceptions of your country's riskiness still matter? Yeah. So you see here, uh, there's, a, there's a, a negative and highly significant effect on country risk, uh, even after firm risk and firm fixed effects are controlled for. Yeah. So this is within firm variation. Uh, and what this here says is that when your country becomes riskier, you invest less, even after controlling for firm level variables. So what this here means is that a one standard deviation increase in country risk decreases your investment rate by about 10% or three percentage points. You see a similar pattern in employment growth. Yeah, so when your country becomes riskier, firms that are based in your country uh, in, uh, um, uh, uh, have lower employment growth than before. So now maybe the most fun part of the paper is kind of looking at how risk is transmitted across borders using this very granular data that we have. So I've already shown you that own country risk seems to affect your firm's outcomes. Now, the question here is, does foreign risk get transmitted across borders as well? So how much of a given rise in a firm's risk is attributable to crises abroad? So what I want to define here is transmission risk of firm I at time T as the sum of all the foreign risk that they're getting. And you can measure that using our measures in various ways. But the one that we think is probably best is by summing up over the interaction between your firm's exposure to country C at time T interacted with the country, that country's riskiness at time T. So if you take this, so this is a firm specific variable and it says this firm, how much of this firm's risk is coming from abroad today? So you might want to know how much of the firm's overall risk on average comes from abroad. And the answer is if you run a regression of firm risk on this variable and our country risk variable, both of those have similar partial R squareds and each account for about 20% of the variation in firm level risk. Yeah, so, so, so in that reading, that's consistent with the view that about one fifth of the risk uh, that firms in our sample talk about co actually comes from abroad. So I'm going back now to the same regression specification that I had before. On the left hand side is the firm's investment rate. I'm going to have in the regression country risk, your country's risk, and a firm fixed effect. And now I'm going to add the risk that's coming from abroad to your firm specifically. Yeah, again, this is a firm quarter spe specific variable. And you see that the coefficients on these two variables are somewhat comparable. So what means, and so both are standardized. So one standard deviation increase here in your firm's transmission risk lowers your firm's investment rate by about 6.5%. To make this very clear where the variation is coming from, let me dummy out all of my country level variation in, in country risks. So I'm going to put in a country year fixed effect here, and you see the coefficient here barely moves. So I'm kind of you know, quite happy about this. Um, you can do this also to make it very clear what this is. It's like you can look only at US firms 
and look at the transmission risk that US firms arrive, receive from abroad. And then you can you know, interpret this as the, uh, um, the relationship between uh, foreign risk landing on US firms and retrenchment in their investment. Remember our second outcome variable here was employment growth. You see exactly the same pattern. There's a strong and significant effect of transmission risk on firm employment. Uh, and you can even see this pattern in stock returns. When your firm's transmission risk is high, your stock returns are low, uh, even after controlling for country time specific variable. Um, so what this further allows us to do is now to ask, where is the risk coming from that firms are uh, worried about? So, uh, you know, according to our measure here, firms in the United States worry most about Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Japan, and Australia, while UK firms worry about Ireland, Australia, Poland, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil. Okay, so this is just kind of one way of looking at the data. You can already see there's a strong gravity structure in here. To make that point a little bit more clearly, let me just show you a picture of where in the world does the Greek crisis get transmitted to? So I'm looking at the transmission risk that comes only from Greece. And I'm showing you this on this on, on, on where it's going on this map. And you see this is here during the Greek crisis 2010 to 2012. You see here the Greek crisis is like massively showing up in European firms. Now take a mental snapshot of that and compare to the Turkish coup in 2016. And you see a very different pattern. Russian firms really worried about this and for some reason, Italian firms. Now compare that again to a very different crisis, which is the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And you see now there's red all over the place. And when you read the transcripts of why is this the case? Why is this Fukushima disaster having such dispersed effects all over the world? It's because the kinds of dependencies here are really kind of very subtle. So for example, one place where this arrow here is landing massively is on France, and in particular on French nuclear firms. And what's really interesting is you can go to French nuclear firms that actually have no observable commercial ties, ties with Japan and see why are they so worried about this? Well, they're so worried about this because the Fukushima, national, uh, the Fukushima disaster might spell disaster for regulatory intervention against nuclear power. Yeah, so they're worried that this is the end of nuclear power and at the end of their business. It's risk that's coming fundamentally from Japan, but you know, here the transmission me mechanism is very subtle. Okay, so let me conclude. So we introduced a novel microfounded measure of the commercial risk, global executives and investors associated with each of 45 countries. Countries that become riskier in the eyes of global investors experience falling asset prices and capital outflows. Firms in these countries reduce investment and hiring even after domestic perceptions and firm level characteristics are controlled for. And we show evidence of a novel type of contagion where firms exposed to a specific foreign country experience rises in risk, lower stock valuation, investment, and hiring in response to a crisis in that foreign country. There's some kind of geeky stuff in the paper about which currencies are safe and which currencies are not. I, I kind of skipped that here, uh, but if you're interested like me in sort of factor structure of exchange rates, then we have something for that as well in the paper. Thank you very much, Tarek. Uh, please, uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. I see Matteo already put, put a question. Do you want to, to, to say your question, Matteo? Yeah, I can read it. Maybe I misunderstood what Tarek, uh, what you said. Uh, that was a really great paper. So, I was wondering the extent to which the average of country risk across, uh, you know, over time equals uh, global risk. Because, you know, you, you may think, I mean, again, it depends on the language the firms use, but sometimes when risk is truly global, World War II or COVID or the global financial crisis, it may not be associated to, with any specific reference to a specific country, right? Yeah. Uh, so, as it turns out that, so here it doesn't matter so much. So the firm risk IT is simply the frequency of the words risk and uncertainty across all transcripts, no treatment of that, whatever, that's the gray line. And it actually is even here like very highly correlated. The blue line is the average of our measures of country risk. So you're right that there is like important differences here, but it turns out they wash out. 
can't, or conceptually you might think there's a lot of differences, but there's just not in, in practice. Okay, so that you're applying a different formula to the same uh, uh, concept. These are two different concepts. One is just uh, firm level uncertainty, and the other is uh, firm uncertainty plus well, not exactly, but you know, no, that's so, a specific. So the, so the blue line is the is average, the measure you just constructed. The average, the unweighted average of our forty-two measures. Okay, I get it. Gotcha. And Nancy has a question, and then Nick has a question. Yes, I do. Thanks. It's, it's a very good paper, uh, Tarek. Now, I just have a question about: uh, Do you differentiate different types of risks? My impression was you are trying to have this quantity of risk versus sentiment, which is very nicely built in in a textual kind of environment. I, I totally like that. But I, I'm just wondering, because looking at the final couple of plots where you show different coops and different, you know, um, type of events that may have different reactions in the world in transmissions. Yes, and then the other one, a you know, couple slides next to this yeah. slide. Um, but you no, know, I'm just wondering whether your paper can establish kind of different global transmission uh, uh, degrees depending on different risk, type of risks, and the location of the risks, right? I think those are great questions. I like we started out with a lot more ambition. And then as we started writing, we realized, oh, we need to like do the basic stuff first. So at first we wanted to do like political and non-political and like 15 things. And then we realized there's kind of a gap in the international finance literature where it's actually not a lot has been done just to, on aggregate variation and risk. So uh, we wanted to focus on that first. But what I like about this approach here is this actually allows you to classify the crises directly by reading the text with not too much work. So you can basically, if you hit the right keys, you can hit exact, you can find exactly, you know, the, the 30 or 40 uh, transcripts that drive like one spike the most, and you can read them and figure out what's going on. And you see here, there's a good mix of things, right? So there's like natural disasters, there's political disasters, there's also like balance of payments crises, uh, there's wars. Uh, so yeah, and we haven't really thought about so you could now go and draw circles around those and see how does the transmission differ across those crises, but we haven't done that yet. Thank you. Um, just, just one more comment here. I, th I think it will be very interesting for kind of as a process, as a process viewpoint to, to see which type of risk gets more international spillovers. Right? That, that would be a very interesting, but I guess you can draw circles around the, the, the events uh, eventually. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> yeah, so those are two different approaches. You could do you could do something more like what we did in our previous papers and just kind of take a stand. This is political. This is non-political. But you would have to figure out. Yeah. So we, we need to think about that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nancy. Nick. Nick has a question. Derek, that was great. I thought it linked nicely actually with George in terms of the uh, the trade kind of trade focus. Um, two thoughts, and I, I know we're out of time, so feel free to park them for later. One is just on countries where they're headquartered. It's probably not a big deal, but there are some companies that are kind of weird, like Old Mutual and South African breweries, I think are both UK headquartered, but are basically South African companies. I don't think it's that common, but I think Alibaba and that bunch of companies are also, I can't remember where the heck, I mean, anyway, you, you can fix that. I think you have to, maybe, maybe it doesn't matter. The other thought is coming back to your original paper, the QJE one, I'm sure again, you've looked at this, but it'd be kind of interesting to see the dynamics. So. Is it that investment goes down and firms blame, you know, bad events in Greece, or is it that there's bad events in Greece and it drives investment down? Um, and I think everything you have in contemporaneous, my guess is it's some combination of both and it'd be kind of interesting to see. Thank Great, you. you don't need to reply now. So we, I know, we talk all the time, so uh, I, I know we're kind of tight on time. Actually, we have two minutes because we started mm -hmm. late. So uh, Tarek, you can answer to, to make it yeah, so for the, the country headquarters, so you're right, there's many different ways of measuring them. Uh, so what we have here is like, well, we're, we think we're using the operational headquarters. But so, so, so I guess I should say that the main, so I guess there's two main places where it shows up. So the first is when deciding what category of firm to exclude from your measure. And the most, ex, the most extreme of that is just, we just go to US firms and we don't worry about, you know. Um, 
So all these measures are constructed not using what we think are the firms that are headquartered in that country. The other place where it matters a lot is when I do these global transmission pictures, right? So they are, you know, the, the destination country of the risk that's then associated with the headquarters of that, of that, uh, of the firm that talks about the event, basically. Um, so here it really will matter, and we should probably do some more robustness checks there. Yeah, very uh, kind of quick related question is this, uh, you know, this uh, tax haven kind of story, this like uh, Apple has this headquarters in Ireland, like those, but yeah, I, I think you, I mean, you probably have taken this into account already, but it's just something like trade people always, FDI people talk a lot, lot, lot about. The other thing is, uh, I mean, it's actually a question, it's about the general, like you claim this is a, a measure of country risk, but you use those kind of firms that headquartered in those countries, it's not a whole sample of firms in the country. Uh, to, to how how can you justify this kind of representative of countries that are in your? Let sample? me let me like this is let me this is very important. So let me let me emphasize this time. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear enough. What we're doing is we're taking global firms and we're looking at how much risk are they associating with a given country. So as a result, I don't actually need any countries in Venezuela to tell you something about. The commercial risk that global firms are perceiving with as it relates to Venezuela. So we're not by any stretch of the imagination arguing that we have like enough coverage so to be measuring from firms that are in that country, right? So so that's not what we're doing. We're, what we're doing is in the simplest the simplest form here is I'm taking all US firms and I'm looking at which which risks in what foreign countries are these U.S. firms complaining about? I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have to stop here. I'd like to thank again Martina, George, and Tarek for their uh, great presentations and to, for all of you that had com comments and questions. And probably Simon would like to say something for tomorrow. Uh, just see you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So yes, tomorrow at 10 a.m. <laughs>